for a written transcript of this meeting or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the Clerk to the Commission's office at 404-612-8232. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second regular meeting of the Fulton County Board of Commissioners. Today is uh, Wednesday, April 17th. It is 10 o'clock a.m. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Rob Pitts. Present. Commissioner Bridget Thorne. Present. Commissioner Bob Ellis. Commissioner Dana Barrett. Present. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Commissioner Marvin Arrington, Jr. Vice Chair Khadija Abdul-Rahman. Present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, please rise for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are thankful for this day, for your continued grace and mercy upon our lives. We bless those who are gathered, give our leaders your wisdom and your direction. It is in your name that we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Continue, Madam Clerk. On page two, consent agenda, 240255, adoption of the consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered routine by the county commission and will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion will take place on these items. If discussion of any consent agenda item is desired, the item will be moved to the secular, second regular meeting agenda for separate consideration. Any items on the consent agenda? None, commissioners. All right, a motion to adopt the consent agenda by uh, Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Page three, secular, second regular meeting agenda. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have an item requested to be added to today's meeting agenda, 240286. Request approval of an intergovernmental agreement for the provision of animal control services between Fulton County, Georgia and the city of Atlanta, sponsored by Chairman Pitts. All right, we need five affirmative votes to add this to the agenda. Uh, this relates to the animal, um, uh, resuming animal service within the city of Atlanta, assuming everybody's up to date, but we need to have this on the agenda today, so I would appreciate your favorable vote to add it. Five affirmative votes. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Thank you. 240262, adoption of the second regular meeting agenda. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have amendments to today's agenda. First amendment is on page five, 240275, Superior Court Administration requests approval of a recommended proposal for electronic pretrial monitoring services. This item was revised to amend the effective date and to provide scores for both firms. On page nine, we have two items for the Board of Registration Elections, 240280 and 0281. This item, both items are revised to change the wording for item number three on board composition. One member shall be appointed by the governing authority of Fulton County, which, shall, which member shall be designated permanent chairperson of the board. We're striking the wording regarding Fulton County legislative delegation. And on 240281, Commissioner Barrett has nominated Kathy Woollard to serve as chair 
for a full board appointment to an unexpired term ending June 30th, 2025. We're striking the word interim. Anything else? That's it. All right, Commissioner, anything else? All right, motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Motion by Commissioner Barrett. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Commissioner Ellis. Yeah, I just had one item. I want to remove 240215. Which page? Page 9 of 10. It's a discussion item. Just, just, I just want to have that removed. Which one? 240215. Anything else, Commissioner? No, sir. All right, Commissioner Hall. I just want to be clear on what we're doing with 24 0275. Which page? Five. Which page? Um, it is on the amendments to the second regular meeting agenda. On page five. Yeah, Which item? What, what's happening here? I'm sorry. Um, this item was revised to amend the effective date from May 1st to upon BOC approval and to provide the scores for both firms. Mm, okay. Anything else? All right, the motion to adopt as amended by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six shades, zero nades. 24-0263, ratification of minutes, recess meeting minutes, March 20th, regular meeting post agenda minutes, April 10th, 2024. All right, the motion to approve by Vice Chair Optu Ronkman, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, zero nays. 240624, presentation of proclamations and certificates. Proclamation recognizing Autism Awareness Month, sponsored by Vice Chair Abdul Rahman and Commissioner Ellis. With the, rep with the representatives with uh, Spectrum, if you're here, please. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lord, please stand on the side. I'm <laughs> sorry, you're so short. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We want to take this time for a proclamation. Um, I'm honored that this has full board uh, support. This is a proclamation where is according to the Georgia Department of Public Health, autism spectrum disorder, ASD, affects one in 64 children in Georgia and is defined as a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral changes. ASD begins before the age of three and lasts throughout a person's life, although symptoms may improve over time and whereas the term spectrum refers to a wide range of signs, symptoms, skills, and level of impairment, and individuals with ASD may communicate, interact, behave, and learn in ways that are different from others without ASD, and whereas according to the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, children in Georgia are diagnosed at three years, nine months on the average, although children can be diagnosed as early as two years old for conditions where an early diagnosis helps to ensure children receive timely and appropriate care. And whereas according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, 
It is important that all children to be screened for developmental delays, especially those children who are at a higher risk for developmental problems due to preterm birth, low birth weight, or having a brother or sister with ASD. And whereas the Fulton County Board of Health wishes to empower parents with support services through its Babies Can't Wait program for children from birth to age three years old, and through the Fulton County Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Services for Adults with Intellectual and Developmental Dis Disabilities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County encourages all parents and caregivers to monitor the developmental milestones of their children and to be aware of possible red flags for autism spectrum disorder and joined with the public health professionals across Georgia to hereby proclaim the month of April as World Autism Month in Fulton County, Georgia. Can you please put your hands together for the recognition? <laughs> All right, I will turn it over to Ms. Blatnick. Thank you so much for um, making April Autism Awareness Month in Fulton County. Um, I do want to make a slight correction from CDC. The latest report is that one in 36 individuals are diagnosed with autism. So you can see that we have kind of a steady climb, and, but this is something that with early intervention, kids can be fully um, you know, participating in life. Uh, my son was diagnosed as a four-year-old uh, with autism, and he uh, was a straight-A student and is now attending Berry College and thriving in the Dean's List and doing great as a freshman. So it t sometimes takes a little bit more accommodations for people, um, but their needs can be met and they can be successful, thriving individuals and adults. We have a number of adults being uh, actually diagnosed with autism. So Spectrum uh, Autism Support, where I work, we have been around for a nonprofit for 25 years. We celebrated our anniversary last year. And we have a new center in downtown Duluth um, on Main Street. And we um, help both the children and the adults with social skills programs. We help the parents with support um, programs. We have day camps for them in the summer because a lot of kids, especially when they're younger, have behaviors that the daycares can't handle and don't want to handle, frankly, and you want them to be in a safer environment where they can understand their needs and be able to take care of them in a loving way, uh, if the, especially if the parents have to work. Um, so these are the types of programs that we fund. I, we appreciate any donations or any sponsorships. I need companies always to sponsor, like our Georgia Race for Autism, which is in the Gwinnett County Fairgrounds on October 5th. Um, anything is welcome. Our uh, email or our website is spectrumautism.org, and I just appreciate this honor. Again, Laura Veladic, Development Director, and if anyone has any questions, I can stay around for a little bit to wait. Thank you. Continue, Madam Clerk. Continuing on page three, public hearings, 240265, public comment. Citizens wishing to participate in public comment will be allowed to appear in person or may choose to participate virtually via Zoom video conferencing or by submitting their comments in writing on the county website, www.fultoncountyga.gov. Priority for public comment will be given to Fulton County citizens and those individuals representing businesses or organizations located within Fulton County. Speakers will be granted up to two minutes each. The public will not be allowed to yield or donate time to other speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting will not exceed 60 minutes. 
In the event the 60-minute time limit is reached prior to public comments being completed, public comment will be suspended and the business portion of the BOC meeting will commence. Public comment will resume at the end of the meeting. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we'll start with speakers here in Assembly Hall. We have received eight speaker cards. Will the first five speakers please come forward? Greg Fan, L.A. Pink, Bakillian Holmes, Mike Russell, and Paul Hershey. Okay, before we begin, uh, first of all, uh, each speaker has two minutes, and when you have 15 seconds remaining, I will say 15 seconds, that's your clue to begin to terminate your remarks. But I'd like to say that uh, probably at our, our last meeting was not one of our finest hours from a decorum point of view. Uh, I've gotten several calls, uh, and even as early as this morning, when I was meeting with the John Hoppert from uh, Grady, he mentioned he saw something on, what is it, this social media stuff, uh, internet, whatever that it is, social, what is it? Twitter, all of that, uh, about that meeting. So I would encourage the public to be respectful of the board, and I would ask and encourage members of the board to res be respectful of the public and of each other. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that, Mr. Chair, but I am going to address Ms. Thorne this morning. Uh, she called my name at the last meeting. Ms. Thorne, let me just say this to you. Uh, I worked for this county for 25 years. I was the president of the union 20 of those years, and I worked in the Department of Public Works. And every commissioner who decided for us to come and be with them at a meeting to discuss things to the citizen because they didn't have the answer. And, you know, I know your resolution, what you're trying to do or maybe attempting to do, don't say that I don't know what I'm talking about, which I do. I really do. Because there were weeks and weeks that you came down here campaigning, talking about stuff that you didn't know what you were talking about. So don't ever use my name and say that I don't know what I'm talking about. If you want to discuss something with me privately and publicly, you got staff, you can call me, we can talk. I do that with everybody down here. Our Commissioner Ellis told me when he first came, he said, Greg, don't do that no more what you did. You remember, Bob, you said it to me? Because you said, Greg, don't do it. I, and I won't do it. I don't believe in doing it. I believe in being respectful, but I need for you to be respectful to also, too, okay? And remember that I'm a taxpayer, and you have to respect the taxpayer. Don't call my name anymore, because if you do, it won't be the same. Thank you. God bless you. God bless your family, and God bless America. Well, 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 I'm glad that you addressed of how we should address you guys because being that we have so much corruption that have already broken and violated every rights of ours, and that's the community. So I just have a couple of questions because it got whiffed to me that Andrew Boones is collecting money for Commissioner Hall, chasing balls, and Al, I mean Ali um, Carter. And we have a very serious problem with that. I got with that um, it will go away. You know, eventually for her to run again, you know, we will eventually just forget that she was chasing balls through County Hall and nothing would be done about it. Absolutely not. Um, today we are asking for Chris Carr to um, do a, a forensic investigation. If we have to call out every name down here, trust me, people's coming. I'm not coming down here for nothing. There's stuff down the pipeline, believe that, trust me. So I, why everybody be sitting there, not listening, acting like stuff is not being um, done. We got a sheriff right now that put a TPO against me because he is scared of what I'm saying online. Then we got Ike Arrington sitting over here blowing kisses, disrespectful. How disrespectful is that in public of the people? to a, a married woman, my husband don't, don't put his hands on me. So very, very happy, but very disrespectful. Some things need to be addressed while, you're, while we're bringing order. Let's bring all the way the order, because I'm telling y'all, <laughs> I got a pass to come for y'all's ass. First of all, I want to thank you guys for the autism. Um, my son, he suffered from autism, and he was one that was murdered out in Clayton County. Seven charges, and that officer 
um, walked free. Mr. Ayrton, I've never addressed you. I've stood with several parents, including the parent of Jarvis Likes, the mother of Jarvis Likes, um, and I just want you to understand, outside of you sitting here, everyone is coming for your bar. As a parent, it is hard, okay? And you sit here in front of these commissioners and you realize that the public may not understand what the truth is, but we're due. And we understand that even when you guys are holding up cases and saying that the officers are, are free to walk, the, the citizens are paying for it, okay? They don't understand what their tax dollars are doing. So thank you guys for admitting to the autism um, and things like that. But I want commissioners and standing in front of you guys to take your job serious. Thank you, Dana. I met you um, at an event with the um, Southern, Rights for Center, uh, Southern Center for Human Rights. Thank you, Khadija. I'm always seeing you, you standing. You know, I can call you two faces out um, from being in the community because the community is paying. Understand that. So the community is paying for you guys to sit here. The community is paying for you guys to do a job. And it means something. Let the tax citizens know when you guys are saying it's okay for commissioners to do what they want to do on the job, the citizens are paying. So it's okay to you if it's not coming out of your wallet. But the taxpayers are paying. It's okay for our kids to be murdered out here on the streets, officers to walk away with seven charges if it's not coming out your pocket, but the citizens are paying. It's okay for commissioners to sit here, hold jobs as commissioners and lawyers, and fail the people. It's okay, right? But the citizens are paying. When I tell seconds. you I will not hush, I will not hush. The parents will not hush. We will continue to stand, and we will let these citizens know that they are paying for our kids to be gone, okay? Make it matter to you. No matter what you have done, make it matter to you. Good morning. The first thing I want to say is, I want to congratulate Chairman Pitts and others who stood firm on the animal control bill, and hopefully we'll move forward and the city will pay their fair share because we need that service immediately. My main point today, the main topic, is once again I am calling for a full and independent investigation and a forensic audit of the sheriff's office. How much more is it going to take before we get four votes to investigate the sheriff's office? We've had the two recent deaths amongst all the others, one in which the crime scene was corrupted before the investigator got there. How much more is it going to take? They blamed the jail, but the jail did not corrupt that crime scene. The sheriff went out and spent, as we know from the independent report, misused inmate welfare fund. The jail didn't do that. We know the sheriff went out and bought a $200,000 Mercedes-Benz van that looks like something off Pimp My Ride that he's claiming is a control center, emergency mobile control center. The jail didn't do that. The sheriff did. So what is it going to take? The jail didn't go to Martha's Vineyard with Mr. Arrington. The sheriff did on our dime. What did we get for that? What did the taxpayers get for that? We need an investigation starting a forensic audit today. And Chairman Pitzer, a lot of folks look to you for leadership, wisdom, and being the voice of reason. I'm asking you to put your weight behind this so that we can get four votes today. We know this needs to be done. It has to be done. We are the laughing stock of the nation. I have even gotten calls this week from overseas about Fulton County and its corruption. This has got to end. We need four votes today to start an investigation and a forensic audit. Thank you. Last three speakers in Assembly Hall, please come forward. Maria Guardio, Janet Hill, and Robbie Cabane. Good morning. My name is Paul Hershey. And again, I would like to commend Chairman Pitts for his opening comments today. But let's talk about your performance last weekend, the last meeting. We have, a, we have a commissioner telling the chairman and the vice chair to shut up. That's, that's a breach of ungentlemanly conduct. We have him attacking Bridget Thorne, commissioner, on an item that was discussed at the retreat 
that her and Natalie Hall were supposed to come up with a recommendation for the use and the, the part-time use of employees, and he said he didn't know anything about it. I guess he missed the retreat. He's blowing kisses to the, to the pink lady. That's a sexual harassment and unwanted sexual advances, and he should resign right now. That's a breach of ethics, and that's going to come. The, 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 the election in 2020 is going to be reviewed May 7th, on Fulton County, because your board of elections aren't doing their job. And then lastly, but not leastly, we have Commissioner Arrington that says, we don't need to get the million dollar taxpayer money back for the sexual harassment that was, was convicted for Ms. Hall. Well, the bottom line is, that means that every, every person in Fulton County has now got standing to cross the lines, district lines, and recall Natalie Hall. That's going to happen. That's going to be addressed May 7th at the State Board of Elections. The bottom line is, do your job. 15 seconds, sorry. You've got two audits that basically said there's malfeasance and, and lack of protocol for spending. Any deficient law. Good morning. Thank you, Maria Gaudio, Fulton County. Um, with regard to the resignation of Patrice uh, Perkins Hooker and the replacement of uh, Kathy Woolard, wholly, totally inappropriate. Two years ago, on October 13th of 2022, uh, Kathy Woolard entered into a contract to sign over the election data, it says the state of Georgia signed a treaty with the Carter Center, October 13th, 2022. Um, the Georgia, Georgia agreed to transfer all the data about its residents and voters to the Carter Center's data centers in Atlanta and Beijing, China. Under what authority, Miss Barrett? What, I mean, come on, you gotta be kidding. Kathy Woolard has overstepped her bounds. She does not have the authorization, she's not an elected official, to give the state of Georgia, let alone Fulton County, any of our data, especially when the Board of Registration's board members have been asking for data and Nadine cannot, and it's only a few keystrokes to pull up a few lists, they still have not received lists from Nadine. What is Nadine doing for her $185,000? Nothing, it should be given to the poor. It would be of more use. And certainly not Kathy Woolard, who is a, a partisan hack from the unfair fight action people. Giving our data to China? Absolutely not. 15 seconds. Thank you, sir. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm here again now for more than five times to respectfully demand an end to deed fraud, forgery, property theft, and other offenses. At a recent town hall that was um, hosted by Bridget Thorne, thank you, Commissioner Thorne, Shay Alexander responded to this issue for a strategy to address deed fraud by suggesting that there should be some type of interaction with the DA, but at the same time mentioned that the police department doesn't know what to do. At a minimum, according to APD, SOP, excuse me, SOP 5220, the Atlanta police is to investigate reported crimes involving fraud. In my case in particular, Susan Property Management admitted fraud to at least eight law enforcement officers. Three judges and nothing has been done. These crimes are systemic and escalating at a rapid rate affecting seniors, veterans, 
single women head of household, and primarily African American, our most vulnerable population. This needs to stop. Thank you. I want to second uh, what Pink has stated in terms of corruption, and I think it's laughable that anyone would talk about respect. You've added an agenda item that is completely fraudulent. Could you speak we up, ma'am? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You've added an agenda item that is completely fraudulent. I've sent you email after email with whistleblowers from Fulton County Animal Services, managed by Lifeline Animal Project, with audio, video, showing breach of contract, showing they're not enforcing our laws. And you're about to have City of Atlanta taxpayers like me pay for a contract that's not performing under Lifeline. And none of you will do anything about it. That is fraud. That is corruption. That is not respectful. How can you talk about respect? That's a question. You want me to pay for something that's not being done. You have seen whistleblowers, staff members, supervisors, animal control officers, dispatchers. They've called, they've emailed. Alton Adams, where, where did he go? Because he was here before you, Dana Barrett. And he told Mandy, Amanda Brennan, I don't want to be involved in your legal entanglements because the staff is under duress, under lifeline. You're going to make us pay for something that's not being done. That is malfeasance, fraud, corruption. What else people know about the mass incarceration complex with prisoners? What a lot of people don't know is that the animal, companion animal industrial complex, where animals make bank for NGOs who are tax exempt, who raise funds, and I guess they're giving them back to you because you all appear corrupt. I'm not going to pay for something that's not being done. Ask Logan Bratt's mother how long she had to be in court with Lifeline, who got zero. The little boy seconds. mauled to death on our streets. You have the same vendor with whistleblowers year after year. Investigate it. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have four speakers on Zoom. Good morning, commissioners. The first person to speak is Ben Howard. Greetings, commissioners and staff, and special greetings, fellow citizens. Ben Howard, senior advocate and public policy analyst. The Georgia Council on Aging is accepting recommendations for issues to be presented to the Georgia State Legislature in January. For information, call 404-281-0430, 404-281-0430. Each April, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, partners with Fair Housing Advocates and organizations to recognize April as Fair Housing Month. The aim is to underscore the Fair Housing Act, to raise awareness of fair housing rights and responsibilities, and among other things, to highlight fair housing enforcement efforts. So to the movers and shakers of the Housing Authority of Fulton County, I call upon you to be creative enough and ambitious enough to develop an annual event which would demonstrate and inculcate Fulton County's commitment to fair housing principles. We'll stay tuned. The next person to speak is Carissa Kyle. Carissa Kyle. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Hi, my name is Caressa Gao. I live in City of South Fulton on Clark Road. For the past number of years, my husband, who is Asian and I'm an African-American woman, have been dealing with anti-Asian hate directed by people we do not know, one of them being Deputy uh, Clayton County Deputy Jamal Hunter. South Fulton police have helped them, apparently, because we go to the city council. We have emailed everybody. And basically, I'm sick of it. I don't even care anymore. I'm not asking for help. I'm just letting you know from whatever I'm seeing from everybody else. I'm going to keep it a buck. 
Either you handle these criminals in your community, either you handle these miscreants and scum, or people are going to have to make sure that they're safe by any means necessary. We are tired. We pay taxes. We want to be able to sleep. The fact that I had people coming to my house, taking pictures of my children, I am disgusted and livid. So there needs to be a final solution to this problem. That being said, have a good day because this crap is going to end. The next person to speak is Bethany Large. Bethany Lange, excuse me, Bethany Lange. Okay, the next person to speak is Derek Blassingame. Derek Blassingame. Okay, yeah, thank you for the time, for the opportunity. Um, as I said last week uh, during the conversation uh, with you all, uh, you know, guys like me, we've reached the hinterland of our devotion to your system that has kept us incarcerated in your court systems, unemployed, underemployed, sleeping under your bridges, behind dumpsters and on the streets, eating out of soup kitchens for no reason other than because of our perceived or sexual orientation. We are sick and tired of being deprived of life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. We are sick and tired of being called sir, when in fact you mean to say heterosexual. We are sick and tired of black women exploiting us for their purpose, existence, and agenda. And we are sick and tired of white women sacrificing us when we refuse to live as a gay man rather than the man that our grandparents, great-grandmother, mothers, and fathers raised us to be. We have carried your weight. We have borne your emotional and mental scars and illnesses. We have fought for your causes. We have wore your stripes. We have marched for you and with you. We have arrived. We are the descendants of those incarcerated in the 1990s due to Joe Biden's 1994 omnibus crime bill. We are those unjustly targeted and criminalized by the government. We have arrived. We are here once again to declare that the check is insufficient. We do not seek any handouts. We do, however, seek recompensation and just do for our labor, sacrifice, and involuntary participation in your various programs and reprogramming. I would like to also co uh, commend uh, Commissioner Bill Ellis for continuing to focus on ethics, procurement, and making sure that we are financially secure and stable and able to overcome all of these inequities as far as financial spending is concerned in this county. Derek Blassingame, the government watchdog. And that concludes the Zoom public comments. All right, Madam Clerk, nothing else? Uh, Vice Chair Abdul Rahman. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would like to take a point of personal privilege, uh, if my colleagues do not mind. To the many people who reached out to me over the past week, I would like to thank you for your outreach and concerns. As a domestic abuse survivor, I understand that last week's meeting was in fact a trigger for many women and men who have been victims of domestic violence. And to you, I offer my sincerest apology, apology for what you watched last week. When I sit here and I watch uh, executive leadership, when I watch presenters, when I watch colleagues get screamed at, as well as myself, it's not a good feeling. However, I want to assure you that your feelings, as well as mine, are valid and it is important. It is never the intention of this body to cause harm or trigger anyone with our words or actions. I will be candid at this point and tell you it does seem like the political theater of Fulton County has become a local reality show, and that is not a good thing. I have decided for myself that I'm either going to be part of the problem or I'm going to be part of the solution. I ask that you join me as well as my colleagues in professional behavior, but stronger consequences when at any time we do go off the rail. Your strength and resilience has inspired me to be a better advocate and an ally for survivors of domestic violence. Thank you for all your courage and sharing your stories. Together, I know we can work creating a world free from abuse and domestic terrorism in any form. Let us continue to stand together in solidarity to combat 
uh, the environment right now. I am not proud of what you saw last week, and I will assure you moving forward that I would do everything in my power to make sure that I hold myself accountable, but also hold all of my co colleagues accountable. Your courage and your resilience in, in, in reaching out to me in the thousands are an inspiration to me. Thank you for your strength and commitment to making a difference. And today, I am committed to that difference. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Bottom of page three, presentations to the board, 240266. MARTA quarterly update. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Greeno, General Manager and CEO of MARTA, grateful for this opportunity to, um, to go through our quarter two briefing. If I could get the, uh, the clicker for the next slide presentation, that would be terrific. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so if we go on into the, uh, the first slide. So Who, who's with you, Mr. Greenwood? Thank you so much. Who's so, with you? Thank you. Um, we have watching online our board members, Stacey Blakely, Frida Hartage, and Al Pond. And MARTA staff here are Carrie Rocha, Jennifer LaRosa, and Colleen Kiernan. All right, so thank you all. Uh, this first, nope, back one, please. Thank you. This first slide, uh, really, I, I wanted to dwell for a second just to recognize the fact that this is the second bus that we've wrapped to uh, recognize the civil rights icons this year in marking the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. The Juanita Jones Abernathy bus is shown in the picture. She served on the MARTA board for over 16 years and advocated tirelessly for our customers. Thank you, Commissioner Hall, for joining us on April 11th at the event with the Abernathy family. Next slide, please. This slide just goes through the agenda. Next slide identifies the fact that operations updates are next. And the next slide is our ridership uh, chart. Now, it's only been six or seven weeks since we last met, so the, the, the slide is the same. Uh, it's a four-year outlook, so six or seven weeks isn't, uh, uh, isn't really showing a difference here, except for the fact that all of the modes are starting to trend upwards again. So we're, we're happy to see that. Um, um, you know, in the meantime, I, I can say that th this is a two-dimensional depiction of what's happening on ridership. It doesn't represent what's happening at MARTA completely. MARTA is doing a lot to make sure that we are ready for the next wave of growth, as we all know that is coming. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we've done things like uh, a 23% reduction in part one crimes over the last two years. Um, I want to remind people that the st station cleanliness campaign is alive and well, gleaning uh, lots of accolades everywhere from you know, customers to the capital. Uh, I want to remind people that the station lighting campaign is now visible in 14 of our 38 stations with the Lux levels brighter in each of these stations, and we won't stop till they're all finished. Those stations include Civic Center, North Avenue, and, and Medical Center. Uh, the MARTA Hope campaign is alive and well with 33,000 engagements in the past three years, 1,400 placements, 4,400 referrals, and 90 family reunifications. Uh, the smart restrooms are alive and well and moving quickly through the area. Four complete, four more by January 2025, and we'll have one every couple of months leading up to the World Cup. Station renovations, new vehicles, and frankly, nailing it when we're called upon during um, uh, major events, concerts, and world-class sporting events. We're expanding our scope of services with investigation of new things like rapid routes, infill rail stations, and a reimagined bus network. And we have a nationally recognized transit-oriented development program aimed at um, building density, growing ridership, and developing the economy. So uh, I just wanted to point that out as we continue to track um, along this two-dimensional chart that MARTA is more than just the ever-increasing ridership chart. Next slide, please. Uh, let's take a look at the bus shelters and amenities. You can see here that we have a commitment for a five fiscal year total of 250. And in order, bless you, in order to do that, we will have to get 126 in FY24. Very confident that we will do that because of the 126 required. 
you can see here that 87 are installed and the balance 39 are, are moving, whether in construction, design, or permitting. Uh, next slide, please. This next slide talks about the, um, you know, there's really a picture that, that the, the statistics are one thing, but here's what it really means to the customer. Uh, a lot of support um, and a managed space, increasing levels of personal health and safety and sense of security in the community. Next slide, please. Uh, just touching base on the security issue, I, I mentioned earlier that we had a 23% decrease in part one crimes. We've also had a 42% decrease in operator assaults. A lot of credit being, um, a lot of credit is deserved by the, the MPD, and in this case, working with APD on the, on the bike uh, program. Um, we've also done 5,000 temporary or year-long system suspensions under the Ride with Respect program and over 70 permanent vans in 2022 and 2023. The, the actions and the efforts of the MPD have been recognized um, by the American Public Transit Association. The photo on the, on the right shows them receiving the gold award for their efforts in this space and being named one of the safest transit systems in the country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the budget. So we are working through our budget now. We're preparing that, and we'll be sharing that with each commission office for feedback during the second week of May. There are our dates where we'll be public on May 15th in DeKalb, May 16th in Fulton, and from there we will um, move through the MARTA board process for approval. Next slide, please. Next slide again, under the capital program, I'm pleased to say that we've got good progress moving on five points. The finding of no significant impact, uh, the FONSI was signed off on March 25, which is the final environmental document required for us to get moving. Um, we, are, we are now working with, the board has also approved on April 11th, approved our uh, demolition contract with Skanska. So we're now finalizing that contract and moving through with the paper grant agreement process, and we expect that uh, this summer work will begin. Of course, that means uh, we will relocate eight bus routes, uh, some of them to Georgia State, some of them to Garnett, while we do this work. And, uh, and I'll remind everyone that it means that the, uh, while the train traffic will be open through five points, northbound, southbound, eastbound, and westbound, the concourse level and the plaza level will be closed to pedestrian traffic so we can get this work done as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Airport Station is also um, making headlines, doing well, showing a lot of progress. Um, you can see here that, you know, all the work that's being done already, there's a lot of social media um, depicting the, the mess that we've made in, this, in, the, um, in the name of progress, and we're very confident that this six-week closure will be exactly what we need to progress the pro program um, to, its, uh, to its natural conclusion. Uh, while we're doing that, I'll remind everyone that we do have 10 coach buses that are filling the gap. So what's happening now is the trains are stopping at College Park Station, and we have uh, coach buses shuttling people from College Park to airport and, and vice versa. Um, they're busy 22 hours a day. They're uh, full most times, very high reliability. There's assistance with luggage and a high reliability on that, on that campaign with 12-minute headways and about 10 minutes travel time between the stations. Next slide, please. We mentioned College Park Station. It's worth mentioning also that College Park is also getting its facelift. You can see here all, those, all the uh, parking lot and concourse issues that have been addressed already. Um, uh, the landscaping at the concrete islands, painting of light pole bases and curbs, asphalt binder and top layer placement on the asphalt, uh, parking striping and parking spaces, and of course security cameras. So the work on the station itself will continue with the concourse design progressing, and I expect work on the platform will begin in late May, early June, and uh, finish in December of 2026. <clears throat> Next slide, please. More work to talk about on the I-285 Express Lane Transit. This is the study uh, program that's been going on that MARTA is leading, um, and the project team is doing very, very well. The policy working group and technical working group are now uh, meeting regularly, and as the station locations are being evaluated, we are looking at the potential demographics that are being affected by the project. Here's one example of that work, and that's really talking about um, the, the red dots 
are those that are transit dependent, cost burdened, and lacking access, and the yellow dots are those that are transit dependent and cost burdened. So these are the populations being prioritized in station location and design considerations. Uh, one other piece of information that we've gleaned is that you'll look at the apex of the, uh, of the, of the arc and you'll realize that um, uh, about 88% of all travelers go as far as the perimeter center at the top and not beyond to the other side of the side of the arc. So that will inform whether or not the bus uh, on the rapid transit starts at one end and goes all the way around or simply does a, a short turn at the middle being more useful to more people more times. Next slide, please. In other martyr news, next slide, uh, Earth Day is April 22nd, that's Monday, but we're starting early. Um, uh, on Saturday, April 20th, we'll have the Global Growers Community Garden, and that is uh, uh, an opportunity for MARTA to celebrate a diverse network of farmers growing food for refugees and local markets. So on that day, we invite you <clears throat> to join us, spend the day learning about pollinators and, and gardening, touring the garden with the East African women who run it, and then purchasing fresh, uh, locally grown produce to take home. It's a fun, free, family-friendly event. And later that day, uh, the Atlanta Electric Vehicle Car Show is going on. Again, you can see EVs of all makes and models, ask questions of the owners, and check out EVs from different manufacturers. Again, a family event. And finally, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, our Artbound program. Uh, just a reminder, we are seeking um, more than 20 artists to design art for our, our rapid transit shelters across Metro Atlanta. And Artbound is also seeking an artist to create a design for the pedestrian bridge. Not the bridge, the bridge screen. We let, we let engineers design the bridge, but artists will do the bridge screen. Um, the application deadline is today, but I wanted to mention it just one more time, and you can apply at the link seen down at, on the lower left corner, uh, martyr.slideroom.com. Last quarter, you remember we announced that MARTA Artbound would host a special Black History Month event at College Park Station. That was on February 29th, featuring Atlanta artist Rafael Bahawinda doing a live painting celebrating black history and culture. And so here you can see a photo from the live painting in progress. And lastly, in partnership with the Fulton County Public Art Program, we'd like to announce that the 2024 public art future residents are Mira Kaufman and Owen Rahm, who will help us explore production of 3D art and collectibles. Thank you, Chairman Fitz. I'll return that. Floor. Thank you, Mr. Greenwood. Uh, Commissioners, Commissioner Harrington, followed by Vice Chair Abdul Rahman. Commissioner Harrington. Good morning, Mr. Greenwood. Good morning, Mr. Harrington. Uh, what is the timeline again for the five points so, station? Uh, yeah, five points. We'll, we'll start working immediately this summer, start dismantling. Um, it's our expectation that this work at a minimum is going to be phased into two phases, one being um, ready, ostensibly ready in terms of safety and uh, operations and uh, some level of engagement and aesthetics by the time the World Cup comes around, but the project itself won't be completed until after the World Cup. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Greenwood, thank you for being here. And you know I'm a big uh, fan of uh, MATA. However, I do want to bring to your attention some, a couple of concerns of mine. And we can have an offline conversation if you'd like. Uh, I have starting as of about two weeks ago, I started receiving calls about um, the bus operators feeling as though they were being phased out by contract workers. And the second call that I re received was about the safety of the buses. I have had some operators to reach out to me and tell me in their opinion, here this is, I'm only repeating to you what they said, that certain measures are not being done or uh, the, the very tight uh, safety uh, factors that you've had in place uh, are beginning to be a little lax. And so these are two concerns that have been brought to my attention. Uh, like I said before I started this, I am a big fan of MATA. I will continue to be a big fan of MATA. But, you know, we do have to take the bad with the good. So if there's a, the concerns or any things that you may be aware of that have been rectified, I want to give you an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Commissioner. I 
I appreciate you being a fan, and I can assure you we will continue to earn that, that status. Uh, in terms of uh, bus drivers feeling that they're being phased out with contract work, that is far from the truth. Contract work only comes in when there are no operators to be found. Uh, in the case of the airport, this is a, a, you know, the world's busiest airport, a major disruption to the people that live and work here. Uh, we, we had to guarantee a reliable level of service. Currently, our operators are, um, are exposing us to absence rates in excess of 80 and 18 and 20 percent. So in fact, this week I've up, been updated that it's the operator absenteeism rate is in excess of 25 percent. That kind of number doesn't allow us to produce the kind of reliability that the customers, that the public deserves. And so, and so that is why we are um, using this as an option. We continue to work with the union, with ATU, um, in seeking opportunities for us to A, improve operator absenteeism, and, and B, work out a process by which they, they will continue to have first right of refusal for all overtime work, as is the case today. Um, so that's that. In terms of safety, I mean, there's nothing more important to MARTA or any transit agency than safety, and, and vehicle safety is chief among them. Um, so I, I'd be happy to talk offline in specifics, but there's, there's no truth to the concept that MARTA is relaxing its safety uh, protocol in any way. Thank you, I appreciate you for addressing that. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know what page this is um, because there's no page numbers, but at the top it says airport station rehab and um, looks page, like page it. Page 10, I would, I would 10. imagine. Right there, yep. Yes, that one. Um, the timeline says first six week closure, April 8th to May 19th. Um, the way that it's written, does this mean that this is first of several closures or is this the, you're shaking your head. Great yes, question. already, no, okay. Great. Thank you for that. So that it, we've divided the work. That, I mean, there's a lot of work that has to happen in the closures and outside of the closures. This closure is going to save us 15 months. Is that right, Carrie? So thank you. This this six week closure saves us 17 months of otherwise, you know, of project time. Um, if required, there is a second closure that's in our schedule for um, early 2026 in order to to make sure that we're ready for the World Cup. But that's if required. At this point, you know, they're they're in, in week one or week two of the of the shutdown, so it's hard to tell. But at this point, we're very pleased with the level of progress. They're, they're ahead of schedule as we speak now. Great, thank you. And then on, since if that is page, what was, what did you say, 10? That was 10, I believe. Okay, yeah. if that was 10, then go to page 12. Um, the title says I-285 Express Lane Transit. And um, when I looked at this, I was, uh, let me see, because I don't need, I'm not old enough to need reading glasses, I guess. So the thick blue line says I-285 ELT study corridor. Um, and it stops above I-20. Is there nothing happening in, on the southern part of Fulton County, because this is all north of I-20. Or is there anything planned for the southern part of Fulton County? Right, that's a great question. This project is a northern arc from, um, you know, east station, eastmost station to the west, western point and doing an arc all around. That's the, the current funding, the current study that's ongoing. There is, I mean, there are conceptually uh, matters that we want to do on the south side, but at this point there's there's been no funding identified, so we will continue to work with our partners, uh, our southern contingencies, but that project or that concept is not at a point where I can actually bring it to to this forum to talk about plans. We don't have that yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, other questions or comments? None? Thank you, Mr. Greenwood. Thank you, Chair. See you next quarter. Okay. Madam Clerk, continue. On page four, 
Invest Atlanta Briefing. Good morning. Good morning, Commission. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for having us. My name is Dr. Eloisa Klementich, and I'm the proud president and CEO at Invest Atlanta. So today's presentation, since it's quarterly, I'll start off with a very overview of 2023, and then I'm going to allow my colleague Jennifer Fine to speak about some projects that we funded in Q1 of 2024. And I move this, or you next slide. Thank you. So this just a reminder for those that are watching us on the screen. There are there were ten at, there were ten TADs tax allocation districts. One has been closed, so there are nine tax allocation districts in the city of Atlanta and Fulton County. Next slide. So we are excited to present the 2023 results on a very high level. Uh, first off, I want to thank the the board because of your commitment. We were able to fund 19 projects in five of our TADs, and this resulted in a leveraged amount and investment in the county of $409 million in private investment. And what does that mean for the average day or for all of us as citizens? It means that there are 1,131 housing units of which 1,050 were affordable housing. And that means affordable housing for 20 plus years in the city of Atlanta. And we were able to activate some of the commercial space in the city and in the county. So let's now I'm going to move it to Jennifer, who's going to talk and highlight just specifically, because the numbers say one thing, but it's not until you actually see the projects that make it very real. Jennifer? Thank you. Next, next slide, please. OK, uh, I'll, I'll flip through these. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We're going to try to get one more, try to get to the images, and I can reference. There we go. Um, so the previous maps that I just went through really quickly just identify exactly where these projects are so you can see kind of the breadth and range of, of location. Um, these three slides are going to give you a visual perspective on a few of these projects and, again, the, the range of, of impact not only on the built environment but obviously uh, to the residents and, and business owners in Fulton County, as well as people who work in Fulton County. Um, the image on the top is the residences at Chosewood Park. Um, this received a $2 million Beltline TAD increment grant for the construction of 107 multifamily housing units in the Chosewood neighborhood adjacent to the Beltline uh, Southside Trail. 90 of the 107 units will be rented at 50 to 60 percent of area median income, so deeply discounted. Um, the bottom image, similarly, is Trinity Flats. Uh, this is a project we're very excited about because it, it gets into another piece of work that Invest Atlanta does in terms of the disposition of city-owned properties and assets. This is a property across the street from City Hall, less than an acre. Um, Invest Atlanta is layering Several of our financing tools to try to get this project across the finish line, what we're finding in particular in, in residential projects, but all projects, very difficult to, to get completely financed um, for, for lots of different reasons. So in addition to a $3 million Eastside TAD grant, we're also layering tax-exempt bond financing as well as City of Atlanta housing opportunity bond financing to get this project done. Hopefully, when completed by the end of 2026, it will include 218 units of housing, all of which will range between 50 and 80 percent of area median income. It will also have about 7,500 square feet of commercial to really try to activate uh, Central Avenue, which is a, a difficult corridor in terms of being pedestrian friendly. And so hopefully this project is going to help that. Uh, next slide, please. Image on the top uh, shows the expansion of the existing, oops, sorry, previous slide. There we go. Thank you. Uh, previous, this is the existing Salvation Army shelter on Marietta Street. Um, it's going to be converted into a modern, multi-purpose homeless shelter, transitional living facility, and workforce development center. Um, it received a $2 million Westside TAD grant 
um, to help complete the $30 million project that will double um, the, the bed count, which is its core operation. Um, we in the Salvation Army, Army want to thank this body. This project came to you last year for approval, um, so we, we thank you for that. Um, and this project has, has a head of steam. Additionally, our uh, partner organization, Atlanta Emerging Markets, also layered in some new market tax credits. Um, so again, multiple tools being used to get these projects up and running. Um, the images on the bottom are of the redevelopment of the long vacant Grove Park Theater into the Grove Park Performing Arts and Cultural Center in the heart of the Grove Park neighborhood. An $830,000 Perry Bolton TAD grant was used to completely, will be used to completely renovate um, and rehabilitate and add square footage to the property to provide not only contemporary space for the arts, um, but also accommodate um, a lot of need for community serving uh, business and retail to the neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. I think this one should be the last slide. Um, so the top images show the new construction of pedestrian-scaled multifamily um, along Joseph E. Boone Boulevard in the English Avenue neighborhood. A $900,000 Westside TAD grant was awarded to the Westside Future Fund as part of its $9 million capital stack uh, to bring 33 units of affordable housing, um, again, to the West Side and English Avenue. In addition, this project will have about 1,200 square feet of commercial space since uh, Boone Boulevard is very much an active commercial corridor. All units will be restricted with rents ranging between 30 and 80% of area median income. And then lastly, the bottom image, also a project um, by the West Side Future Fund. Um, new construction of 24 units of multifamily development at the intersection of Donald Lee Hollowell and North Side Drive, also in English Avenue. Um, Invest Atlanta provided a $640,000 Westside TAD grant, again, to the Westside Future Fund for this development. It's an investment of about $6.5 million into the community. Um, completion expected in mid-2025. And so just these two projects alone represent 57 units of deeply discounted, affordable, and workforce housing that will be restricted um, for at least 30 years. So we're, we're very proud of that um, duration of affordability. Um, and then I think, Dr. Clementich, you wanted to mention a couple things yeah. about these projects? Yes, these two projects, 839 and 646, and I'll add one more. It's uh, 385, Joseph D. Lowry, still need to come to this board for approval, so just wanted to flag that for you. Uh, together, they will represent 89 affordable, uh, 89 units, of which 73 will be affordable. That's 82%. Uh, so it does not require any additional funding by this board only approval, and we believe that this is important for our communities and to be able to continue to live in their communities and, and sustain themselves in a way that's affordable to them. So with that, we've moved the, uh, any specific financials on each of the TADs to the appendix, but we have that information, and I thank Nino for joining me. Nino is our CFO at Investalana, and I'd open it up to any questions that commissioners may have. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, your leadership in um, asking that we have a regular quarterly uh, report from uh, Invest Atlanta. I think it's good for us to know as a body and for the public to know um, what Fulton County's contribution is to some of this development um, within Atlanta um, and just for us to have a sense of how the TAD dollars are being spent. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Clementich and team, Jennifer and Nino, thank you guys for being here. Um, I want to... Um, commend you also for um, taking this approach as an organization and, and your leadership on this, Dr. Clementich, to um, always look to include community benefit when you're looking at economic development. I think it's hugely important. Um, and the idea that you are always looking to include affordable housing, looking at things like food deserts, um, pu uh, public health deserts, and all those things I think are just critically important. So thank you for your leadership on that. Um, and then I just want to ask you one clarifying question on the three um, items that you mentioned that will come before the board. I know you mentioned no additional funding, which is, I think, an important point. Um, but also, just to reiterate for everybody, this is 
um, because of a quirk in the way one of the TADs is uh, written. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And the West Side TAD specifically states any project in the West Side TAD needs to come back to this body. So after it gets voted on by the Invest Atlanta Board, of which thank you for your participation, it needs to come here. But again, I, I'll just read it. No additional funding. We just need to uh, ensure that we can get your approval. Thank yeah, you. I just wanted to make it clear that, that's, that all of the projects don't come, just several, and it's because of this right. quirk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, other questions? Any other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Thorne. Um, on the TAD activity report, um, what are the, the numbers? Uh, it says, like, for instance, the top one, 495 and then 1.45. Is that Fulton County's portion in that column and then the overall of all contributors to that TAD? I'm, I don't know what chart it is. It was this chart, whatever this chart oh, is. Oh, this one. This one here. Oh, okay. I got you. Um, so you're asking about the numbers on the very last row? Well, it's it, it has, have, you know, headers for leverage, but the two prior numbers, it doesn't have any heading on oh, it. Oh, I see. I see. That, uh, the, the number on the furthest left column, that's the amount of TAD money that was awarded to the project. Okay. And then the column to the right of that is total project cost. And then the leverage is just the difference between the two. Okay. Is that, and is there anywhere- It's very small on my printout, so I hope I-, I was No, no, that, that, right. that's great. I appreciate all the detail and all yeah. that you've put into this presentation. Well, I wanna make sure you all see the numbers, but it's no, it, yeah, it's just TAD funding, total project cost, and then the difference of those two is basically how much funding is being leveraged by the TAD commitment. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, is there a breakdown of how much just Fulton County's portion is of the TAD or? Um... Um, not on, on this, I mean, anecdotally, it, it, it's always gonna be for, well, yeah, about 23%, unless sometimes okay. in, in the corridors TADs, it gets a little quirky there, but yeah, it's always gonna be about 23%. Because okay. um, that's the contribution to the increment. Okay, thank you. That that was all I had. All right. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much. See you next quarter. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, continue. Continuing on page four, county manager's items under open and responsible government, twenty four zero two six eight presentation of the Fulton County operational report. Manager. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. We will have a brief report today and then anticipate returning to the full operational report uh, in the month of uh, May. So let me start with the cyber response. We continue to address the uh, incident that uh, began on January the 28th, so we're approaching now about the three-month mark. Uh, all the major systems uh, have largely been restored. We're now in the detailed work at an individual service level. In fact, we're tracking over 375 services that we're working to completion with steps and dates uh, clearly, uh, clearly outlined. They range from something like a simple phone line that may not be uh, uh, completely uh, pointed to the right place or printer connectivity in specific uh, users uh, for specific users or reports like the one that I would use for this not being able to generate. But we're glad to say as an example Public printing has been restored in all of our libraries. Uh, in another, we're still needing to manually enter uh, information for vendor registration rather than having that self-service option. So that's a couple of examples. I've characterized it to, uh, to our uh, leaders as three yards in a cloud of dust, and meaning that there's nothing sophisticated about getting this across the goal line now. It's really uh, one thing after another to uh, continue to resolve. There's always the opportunity for some setback, again, with this uh, underlying uh, technical uh, implementation that we're doing, but uh, I have great confidence that uh, we will uh, now see this fully restored in the next uh, month to month and a half. So by end of April to, uh, to mid-May or so, I believe will be uh, fully restored. Uh, we continue to encourage customers to contact us with any difficulties at customer service at FultonCountyGA.gov or call our customer service number at 404-612-4000. Uh, 
Uh, last, I just want to note that uh, Human Resources under uh, Ken Herman's leadership has resumed hiring and all other AR tra uh, HR transactions uh, as of this month. So I want to thank our staff for being uh, patient with us uh, as it relates to bringing that service back as well as their continued hard, fo their continued hard work and, and focus, as well as the public for, for their understanding. Um, turning to animal control for just a, a moment, we know you'll be addressing this situation later today. Uh, we're fully prepared to resume services to the City of Atlanta immediately. Communicated with our EMA Director, 911 Director, External Affairs uh, Director, and Police Chief this morning to ask them to uh, be ready to move forward uh, upon a favorable execution. I want to let you know that our staff has continued to, I think, uh, handle uh, this situation a great deal of professionalism. We have taken in 98 dogs. If we don't found two more, it'd be a, a round number of 100. Uh, but those are uh, in our care. They have either been returned to owners or uh, been, uh, been adopted or still in our care. So again, thank you for uh, considering that. Uh, the issue of the water bills, let me just address that uh, briefly. We have continued to evaluate uh, that information. We are meeting it uh, internally. Uh, on those, we have not found any past due bills since 2007. There may be some late fees that have been um, uh, implemented that uh, perhaps could be due. Uh, our CFO is meeting with the Atlanta CFO and watershed uh, personnel on May the 9th, and that's the date that uh, they selected for uh, a, a joint meeting. So hopefully that's on its way to, uh, to resolution. Uh, on capital projects, as you recall, last meeting we gave an update on the Behavioral Health Crisis Center. I just wanted to let you know about two or three more. All of these are public health focused, so I want to compliment the board in terms of in the midst of everything else that, that certainly we have to contend with maintaining your uh, focus on public health in particular. Uh, we will be issuing procurements for the North Fulton Health and Human Services. Uh, center campus as well as the South Fulton Developmental Disability Facility this month. So look for those and then uh, that work to begin. Also, we anticipate a significant announcement uh, today from Grady um, to better serve South Fulton. Of course, that's been a focus of this board since the closing of the AMC facilities. And I think when the, when the public uh, fully uh, uh, understands our commitment and then also Grady's announcements, they will be, uh, they'll be very pleased uh, with that. Finally, on elections, our cross-functional team continues to meet uh, as elections prepares for early voting, which begins April 29th, 36 locations. We're confident that the team is well prepared and will have the resources to address any issues. Uh, each meeting, we had, uh, meet directly with elections leadership and address any issues with technology, facilities, security, human resources, finances, and public relations. And this, this whole of government approach has really served us well since summer of 2020. So we look forward, uh, Mr. Chairman, to a successful election in 2024. So I think with that, that concludes our uh, operational report. And if there are any questions, I'm prepared to answer those. Right. Questions, commissioners? Any questions? So you're gonna be meeting with a uh city because I want to resolve this water bill issue uh, once and for all. Yes, sir. Let me uh, if we hold on. Oh, go ahead. I'm if, sorry. If we owe, I want to pay. If we do not owe, we need to put it to bed. And after that meeting on the 9th, if we cannot reach an agreement, then what's the next step? Arbitration? Yes, sir. I think it would be. But sh let me defer to Sharon Whitmore, our CFO, who will be leading that. Because what I don't want to do is keep going back and forth. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I, I honestly don't expect that we will resolve the matter on the 9th. Um, I think that it will take beyond that. Um, it really why, depends. Why is that? Our analysis that we've conducted thus far um, goes back to 2007. In part, we've used data that the City of Atlanta has provided us where we can see that based on what they've billed and based on what our, their records show we've paid, or our records show that we've paid. Um, we have, in essence, every year paid an amount equivalent to what we have been billed. Um, so I think that this is going to, like I said in the last meeting, be a very old balance um, that they have not yet been able to provide 
any details to support. So I, I'm not certain that the very first meeting that we have, we will reach a resolution. Um, we are going to go with all of the information and analysis that we've prepared and hope that the city will come with um, their own analysis so we can uh, review it and try to isolate the period of time that this balance accrued actually um, belongs to. Um, so I, I don't expect that we'll resolve it in, in one meeting. Have you communicated to the city what you expect from them at that meeting on the night? I ask simply that we have a meeting to discuss our account and that we have that meeting with the city CFO and with members from uh, Watershed and we will have um, representation from the county's finance department and the Department of Real Estate and Asset Management. Uh, we have not yet decided whether or not we would invite the member of the county attorney's team who has um, been meeting with us. We are having weekly meetings um, in order to be as prepared for that meeting um, as we can be on the 9th. Okay, again, I don't want this thing to drag on. Um, you need to resolve it. And Commissioner Arrington at the uh, last meeting brought up the statute of limitations, and which made sense to me if that's accurate. And Madam County Attorney, have you had a chance to review that? Because if, if that's true, then I'm not sure what we're talking about. There are statutes of limitations that apply. Um, we have not uh, reviewed what the city of Atlanta has provided to see if it may fit with any exceptions that also may apply that may um, alter the application of the, the straight statute of limitations. Okay, all of this needs to be addressed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because I mean, this has been going on too long. Uh, Vice Chair, followed by Commissioner Barrett, followed by Commissioner Arrington. Thank you, Chairman. I, I concur with you, but I'm going to openly, on record, ask uh, the county manager as well as the county attorney as well as the CFO. Uh, my, my contention is not for us to be adversarial with the city of Atlanta. First of all, let me be crystal clear. And I don't think anybody here wants to be adversarial with the city of Atlanta. However, moving forward, I would not like to see anything, county manager, that we're working on conditionally based on us giving city of Atlanta something. I think that's not a good faith, in my opinion. I think you have shown a reasonable amount of attention to detail, but the issue that I have today that I think needs to be addressed is if we have a conversation or a partnership saying, I can't do this unless you give me that, it's just not a good faith way of doing business. I think collaboratively, we have the same concerns, whether it's homelessness, whether it's getting, uh, you know, our justice partners to help move the court system along. I think all of that, we're on the same page. At least I would hope we are. But I do believe that in any negotiations that you do moving forward, both sides need to be fair and it needs to be an understanding of what we are negotiating for. Not after the negotiation is done, okay, I've decided if I'm going to do this, I want you to throw this in. I have an issue with that. I want to publicly let the voting taxpaying citizens of Fulton County and City of Atlanta know that I have a problem with that. And I will ask at any time, if you see that happening, that maybe you would hit the reset button. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wasn't going to ask this, but since you brought up the um, statute of limitations, I just wanted to um, come back to you on that for a second, uh, Madam County Attorney. The exceptions you're talking about are what if they have continued to present a bill? Like what changes the game here? So one of, so again, not having seen what the city has presented, I think ultimately this dispute is going to come down to, um, as the vice chair uh, referred to, what we actually owe. Not in, you know, not necessarily. Um, so 
in order to determine that, we're going to have to see whether or not any exceptions, such as, for example, anything that would toll the statute of limitations. The, the whole question of the statute is, when do you begin the calculation of the time running? And so certain things will allow the time to restart. We don't know if there is a situation in this instance that creates such an exception, but that's what we would look for before we would um, assert that position. Okay, so I just, I guess, want to make a, an official ask then that you all work together and, and give us an answer next uh, meeting on whether or not that would apply. Um, and also, um, um, Madam CFO and, and Mr. County Manager, um, given, and I appreciate what you, what you said, uh, Madam CFO, about the time that this will take, um, and also, of course, the chairman's request that we deal with this once and for all, because it, from what I understand from you through other conversations, this is something that sort of bubbles back up every seven years or something like that. And there are some conversations that are had, and then it just, we sort of don't get the information we've asked for, and it sort of dies away again. So um, could I make an official ask that we just get reports on this at each meeting until it's resolved? Uh, and that we do set some sort of timeline, and I'm not sure, I'll leave that to you, but some sort of timeline to say, okay, now it is time to move to mediation um, if we're not getting the response that we want so that we can sort of put this to bed once and for all. We'll be happy to do that. Um, we are internally meeting weekly, um, working on our own reconciliation um, effort and offered multiple dates to meet with the city, but the earliest date that um, uh, I believe, in part, I think it's their budget season for them. Um, the the date that came back from them that we agreed to was May the 9th. So um, we will, I don't know that we'll have much to update you with on the 1st, but um, certainly that second meeting in May. Yeah, and we do have um, someone from Sue's team that is um, in our weekly meetings that we are sharing all of our information with so she can um, advise us accordingly as we proceed. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure, obviously email updates are great too, but I just want to make sure because the public is paying attention to this both um, from the city side and from our side that we're being as transparent as we can about what's going on. So, Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Arrington. Did we receive any of the actual bills, or did you all receive any actual bills? Because the only thing I saw was the was that spreadsheet that was forwarded. We receive a monthly um, uh, utility bill from the city. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm maybe I didn't do a good job of asking the question In, as it relates to the outstanding balance that they are claiming. Have we seen, have we received any specific bills related to that outstanding balance that they're claiming? The monthly utility bills include um, a um, previous balance listed on each individual um, account bill. And so are you saying that we've received bills for the last four years that have that outstanding balance on it? We have received bills at least for as long as this current billing system that they're using. Um, if there was a previous balance, um, the, the document that we received would show the previous balance. The previous balance could be a longstanding balance or it could be that they had not yet applied our most recent payment and was carrying forward a balance from the previous billing cycle. All right, I, um, I don't know, I guess I'm curious, to, I, 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 I guess I want to see the bills. I mean, because for me, it's about dates of service. We can share some sample bills with you, um, like the most recent ones that we've received. Yeah, and in particular, I want to know how, how long how long have we been receiving a bill that says we owe $4.7 million? Because I, I can't imagine that you were receiving a $4.7 million bill and not paying it. As I indicated in the last meeting, because we have over, I think it's 90 accounts, individual accounts with the city, um, it's not one bill. So it's multiple bills, the largest of which is the bill that we receive for the property that the jail resides on. Um, so that bill will have the largest outstanding balance. And I can tell you that based on uh, the information 
that the city sent us, which was an Excel spreadsheet. Um, this was provided to us back in 2018 or 2019, maybe it's 2019. Um, the balance as of 12-31-2007 was 2,054,000. The balance as of June of 2019 was 2,070-something thousand. But you could see in each year the amount that they billed and the amount that we paid. So we paid what they were billing, which is why I'm saying I think this is going to be a very old balance that has never been substantiated to us, which is why it hasn't been paid. Yeah, so I think the first step, Madam County Attorney, is to provide the analysis on OCGA 9325. Um, this is an open account, and the statute is clear that claims on open accounts must be brought within four years. So I would hate to see our staff spending time going back to 2007 on something that is uncollectible. Anything, this is 2024. So anything that's prior to 2020, April 17th, 2020, is uncollectible. So um, I, I think that's the first step in the analysis to prevent a whole bunch of busy work back to 2007. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, if they can't collect on anything prior to 2020, then I don't know that there's any reason to talk about it. So we will provide that. Um, we have our finance team already working on that matter, and uh, primarily they just need to examine the invoices for the very thing that you were asking about, which is whether or not the outstanding balance is indicated on each monthly invoice. But we will provide that. Thank you. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would also like to see those uh, bills that are for the period of time that um, we're speaking about because last meeting you did kind of give us a history and you took that history all the way back to the 90s. And uh, that was very concerning that we have been in this situation repeatedly um, since the 90s and it hasn't been reconciled. So um, that would be great to have that information. Um, as of today though, what exactly do you actually have um, that you're reviewing? Uh, Commissioner Hall, we're, um, we're using data out of our ener energy cap um, utility management system um, where we upload the bills monthly and that information goes back to 2017, I believe. Um, after that, we're going into um, uh, our financial system, looking at all of the transactions that have, have posted and we will then have to go and pull hard copies um, of uh, individual documents that have been provided. We also have um, information that the city of Atlanta has provided to us um, in an Excel form, um, which is their billing and payment and adjustments um, uh, information that goes back to 2007. So looking at and analyzing the information that they actually provided to us in an Excel file um, is why I can say that between 2007, the end of 2007 and the middle of 2019, the amount that they billed has been paid for that period of time. Um, Again, which is why I keep coming back to this balance is from 2007 or earlier than that. We also have documentation from the city um, indicating to us um, 
certain amounts that were owed around the time of the United Water transition where we can show we paid what they said was owed, but we asked for additional information and never received it. Um, well, let me say this. We, we paid what they invoiced us for, what they sent bills for, but they had a balance beyond that, which they could not provide the documentation to support, um, which, as far as I know, was never paid. So that's why I keep coming back to, I think we're going to go all the way back to the transition to United Water, um, and maybe even as far back as to how um, payments were applied against an escrow account that was established with them in the mid 80s. Um, so it, it is not a, in my opinion, it's not a current billing issue. We're paying currently what they are currently billing us. It's a really old, long standing balance. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking about the last discussion we had at the last BOC meeting and the comment that was made earlier about what happened, but what a lot of people did not see that was happening is that Commissioner Khadija kept talking over me when it was not her turn. And I kept stopping and saying to her, I would allow her to speak if there was something she needed to say. And the chairman kept banging the gavel to say to her, please stop. Commissioner Hall, you have the floor. Um, during that time, by the time it got to Commissioner Arrington, he was already frustrated from the disrespect and the disruptive behavior. So by the time it got to him, and Commissioner Khadija started talking, trying to talk over him. All right. His uh, anger was at a different level. Um, Commissioner Hall. Yes, sir. I'm talking about the water bills now. Yeah, I'm talking about the um, animal control stuff and the water bills and all of that, because this was the conversation that happened last time. And speaking of um, being triggered, uh, that was a trigger for me because I, too, have been bullied all my life for being tall and skinny and long hair and tall olive oil. Hall, the, the and matter before the us same now woman is the, the tried water to bills. Fight me, tried to fight me. Commissioner Hall, please. Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Hall, please. Commissioner Hall. Ms. Commissioner Hall, you're out of order. 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 You're out of order. Commissioner Hall, please. 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 All right. Commissioner Ellis. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Trying to get back my mic here. Here we go. Thanks for bringing us back to regular order. Um, I just want to make sure I understood that basically we paid everything that we've that's been substantiated that we owe. We are current and we paid it. That's what I heard you say. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm with Commissioner Arrington. I don't want you all wasting any more of your time to trying to disprove a negative. The onus is on the other party to demonstrate that we owe something and it's substantiated. If they can't, I don't know why, we have a lot of things that we need you focused on. And going back and looking at water bills pre-2005 or 2007 is, is not in any of our best interest in terms of the value of your time. Um, so, you know, you all want to have a meeting, great, but you told me all I need to know. We paid everything that's been substantiated that we owe. And it should end there until somebody can substantiate that we actually owe something different. And if they do, we should verify that some sort of statute had to run out on it. And then with all that, then after that, if we need to have a conversation, we can have a conversation. 
But I don't know why we are trying to go and do the work ourselves. It makes no sense. Total waste of your time. So. I concur. Uh, Vice Chair Abdurrahman. Thank you, Chairman. I want to take this time to apologize to the audience and thank you for getting us back on track, Chairman. I appreciate your leadership. Um, what I would like to say to you, uh, uh, Ms. Whitmore, I concur with what Commissioner Ellis says, but I just want to add that as a sitting commissioner that get calls from one end of the county to the other, I have had to answer to constituents who have had billing issues, who have said, I've asked, I know this bill is incorrect, blase. So I say that to say this, I believe that you and what you do and from your expertise know what is old and that's what's been substantiated. I do not want us to be on this whirlwind of trying to uh, defend something that has not been substantiated. Because even in our everyday lives, if we have a billing error, what do we do? We call the company and we ask them to substantiate it. And so I don't want this to become politicized. If we owe and the, um, the, the statute of limitations does not apply, then yes, we should pay. But it have, if it has not been substantiated, uh, I know the United Water, I know that from way back then, there were some challenges. There were bills that we received that were not correct. And so what I'm saying to you, which is getting to sound like a, uh, a, a broke record, is if, in fact, we owe, I am of the utmost belief in your capability to let us know if there's an issue. If we do not owe, then I want it to be put to bed. And I would appreciate if that is the mindset that you and the county manager take with this, because we have more pressing issues in Fulton County to argue about a bill that is no, doesn't exist. And even if it does exist, it is on the behalf of those that build us to substantiate it, as opposed to us having to substantiate it. So I would appreciate if we would allow the executive staff to do what we paid them to do. Thank you. Commissioner Thorne, you have the floor. I'll be brief. I just want to say that I concur with the previous comments made. Uh, the onus is on them. They need to provide the burden of proof. And then if we need to defend it, we'll, we can research and defend it. But I don't think you need to spend countless hours on your department going through archive files. I imagine there's probably paper files or whatever, microfiche. I don't know what you'll have to go back to. But uh, I don't want you to waste your time, your valuable time on this. Um, we're launching a new financial system right now. And you guys need to be focused on that and not on this water bill issue. Thank you. All right, other comments? All right, uh, Madam CFO, Madam County Attorney, you have your marching order. You need to resolve the issue of the statute of limitations first. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Manager? No, sir. That concludes our report. All right, continue, Madam Clerk. Continuing on page 4, 240269, Finance, Presentation, Review, and Approval of April 17, 2024, Budget Soundings and Resolution. Madam CFO. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a, a no funding required ask um, for an add to the um, annual hardware and software maintenance support list for um, West Law um, for the uh, inmates uh, use at the county jail paid for out of the inmate welfare fund, excuse me, out of the inmate services unit in non-agency. All right, a motion to approve by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Next item. 24-0270, real estate and asset management. Request approval of the lowest responsible bidders in the total amount of $345,000 to provide carpet, carpet tile, installation, and repair services. 
Our motion to approve by Commissioner Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. 24-0271 requests approval of the lowest responsible bidder in an amount not to exceed $1,071,000 to provide demolition services. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Tw unanimously with Commissioner Arrington. 24-0272, request approval of the lowest responsible bidders in an amount not to exceed $981,071 to provide janitorial services. Motion to approve by Commissioner Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, unanimously with Commissioner Ellis. On page five, under Health and Human Services, 240245, Community Development, Request approval of a contract between Fulton County and Destination Tomorrow, Inc. in the amount of $100,000 to support the Wellness Journey Program. All right, is there a motion? Is there a motion? All right, uh, motion to approve by Commissioner Abdul Rockman, seconded by Commissioner Ellis. Commissioner Thorne. Uh, I know it was held last time. I just wanted you to speak on it because you thought it might conflict and just what you heard when you researched this item. <laughs> yes, uh, I, the reason I supported the hold of it is because um, I think there was a little conflict on what the work that they do. The actual person from Destination uh, Tomorrow is here if you want to come forward with it and just explain to my colleagues what it is that you all do, and so we we'll know moving forward um, what this actual program does. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Alex Santiago, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Destination Tomorrow. Um, I was in the last meeting when I heard several people say they had never heard of us, and um, it didn't surprise me because we're kind of a small organization that kind of gets swallowed up by the big fish, um, but we're an organization that we don't just focus on HIV testing, we focus on the entire person. So we focus on the, the, um, the things that get them in the position where they are. So we have a work for, workforce development program. We have a financial literacy program. We partner with the um, Atlanta Postal Credit Union to be able to open accounts for people who, who can't normally you know, access bank accounts. So we're more than just a one-stop shop. We, we provide services and resources for the whole person. My quick question to you, do you exclusively just work with HIV only or do you work with the greater community? The greater community, HIV is a very, very, very small part of what we do. We focus on, on empowering people and putting them in positions where they're not at risk for HIV. So we figure that if we can get the social determinants of health, like lack of food, we have a food pantry, we have a workforce development program, we have a GED program, we do things to, to help the whole human and not just one part. Thank you. Commissioner Arrington. Yes, I see this is listed under community development. Who do we have here from community development to talk about this? Good morning, Stan Wilson, community development. Okay, so um, I guess tell, tell us about this and why, why you are requesting this and how this came about. Uh, the item came about, it was included within the budget. 
and as part of the budget uh, funding this agency, it was assigned to community development. So it's it's a project that's under under my department. Okay, and um, have you worked with this group before? Uh, no, I have not. Are you aware of this group uh, prior, prior to today or no, the last not, meeting? No, not prior to the, not prior to reaching out to them after it was included in the budget. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, you, kept, you keep saying it was included in the budget. Did you include it in the budget for your department? It was a commissioner recommendation that was added to the budget. You said it was it what? Was a, it was a commissioner recommendation and the, and the board approved it as part of the budget. It was a commissioner's recommendation that was added in which commissioner? Uh, when the initial discussion started, it was Commissioner Abdul Rahman, Vice Chair Abdul Rahman. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Barrett. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, weigh in, but I think we got the answer. Um, it, this was something we committed to. It was a c commissioner's budget enhancement that occurred on the day of the budget. Um, we were provided with a brief paragraph about the organization ahead of time, but nothing beyond that. So I think that may have been why there was some confusion. It sounds like you do great work. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna support it obviously, but in part because you're doing great work uh, and in part because we made a commitment as a board. So I just wanted to weigh in and share my support. All right, any other comments? The motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote. And Madam. the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeays, zero nays. Next item. 240273, request approval of a contract between Fulton County and the Inner City Muslim Action Network Corporation in amount of $75,000 to complete phase one renovations of the Wellness Center and Food Pantry. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Abdul Rahman, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Any questions? Let's vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Under justice and safety, 240274, Superior Court Administration, requests approval to extend an existing Mr. contract. Point order, Mr. Chair. Yes. 274 and 275 seem like they go in tandem and work with each other. It seems like we should hear them both at the same time and vote them at the same time since they're contingent with one another. No objection. Okay, 240274, request approval to extend an existing contract in an amount not to exceed $305,000 for additional 30-day period to complete the transition of the new service provider for electronic pretrial monitoring services. 240275, with the amended effective date, request approval of a recommended proposal in an amount not to exceed $2 million to provide electronic free trial monitoring services. Point of order, Mr. Chair, I object to these items being heard together. All right, uh, all right let's vote on whether or not we should take uh, 0274 and 0275 together. Point of order, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Arrington, can you explain why? I may support one, but not the other. All right, you ready? Yes. All right, let's vote on whether or not to take the two together. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, three nays. All right. Mr. Manager, you wanna uh, give us the context here and where we are. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask uh, David Summerlin uh, from Superior Court, who will be the program administrator for this, and Stephen Araki from the strategy office, who have been working hand in glove. And then obviously Felicia will be available to answer any questions. 
you know, the net net of this is we have had an ankle monitoring uh, provider. The uh, RFP was issued, a new provider was selected. Uh, we are now in the process of planning the transition to ensure a seamless transition, and Steve will uh, overview the steps that have to be taken. The good news is there's some technology that uh, allows that transition to go fairly seamlessly for about half of the uh, folks who uh, have an ankle monitor, but there is you know, a, a series of steps that have to be taken to change ankle monitors out for those that are on older technology. So again, Steve can overview that. David can also answer any questions about the program overall and the board's direction, uh, which has been, I think, uh, very much accepted by and endorsed by um, the uh, chief judge as well as uh, uh, others on the bench. So we'll be glad to talk to you about uh, all of that, sir. All right, Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. County Manager. I believe there are two slides um, to kind of help guide the conversation right now. If we have those, I think they, do we have those, Ms. Greer? Uh, they okay. And as they're pulling them up, I can kind of set the stage. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Commissioners. Uh, as the county manager uh, teed us up, um, just to give some background, we currently have about 1,100 plus um, participants in the county funded uh, electronic monitoring program. Um, the next agenda item, uh, or excuse me, this agenda item um, to approve the, um, or excuse me, to, to extend the, uh, to extend the um, current provider um, will help uh, kind of with the transition. Now, oh, there we go. If we can go to the next slide. Who are you, sir? Uh, excuse me, Commissioner Arrington. Steve Naraki, uh, County Manager's Office, Strategy Office. Um, okay. So we have currently about 1,100 participants in the county-funded electronic monitoring program. Um, under our current configuration, using ANA all-county monitoring, um, now owned by Teletrex, there are two separate counties providing the technology and the devices. Uh, roughly half of them, about 600, are using older technology, uh, Sentinel, OmniLink, and about 500. So the balance are using this new technology, AMS, SCRAM. What we're trying to do here with the approval um, on the next agenda item to move to a second chance, all their ankle monitors will be exclusively this newer technology, AMS and SCRAM. So upon board approval, um, we will need to swap over both the technology component and devices. Uh, for the technology component with AMS SCRAM, that process has already started. Uh, and will be completed on the 19th, again, assuming we have favorable approval by the Board of Commissioners. For the older technology, that roughly 600 participants, we will need a period of time, several week, weeks, to um, transmit all the information, provide necessary information, contact uh, the participants on the older technology, and then schedule appointments and start swapping out those devices. And we believe this can be achieved within kind of that last week of April timeframe. Um, to support, because we know there's a pretty large population of 1,100 and they're spread out throughout the county in the metro area, um, a second chance will have locations throughout the metro area at their different facilities. Most of them are um, at the county jails of, our, of both Fulton and the, uh, and the counties in the surrounding metro area. Um, and the, the target to swap out everything on the older uh, Sentinel OmniLink uh, monitors would be complete by early May, first or second week of May. So I'll pause oh. there with any questions. Excuse me. Go ahead and go to the next chart and then ask for any questions in terms sure. of what the plan is. And our, yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. County Manager. So our next plan is kind of the continuation once we do have um, the ankle monitors or the new, the, the uh, ankle monitors transitioned over what Superior Court's kind of continuing monitoring and a reduction plan would look like. And I'll ask Mr. Summerlin to speak to that. Good morning, Commissioners. David Summerlin, Court Administrator. And this is just to reiterate what Steve just kind of explained. Uh, this program is sort of being turned over to Court Administration to manage. We're going to be monitoring the monitors. Um, so we're going to be receiving information. We're going to be reviewing all um, clients who are currently monitored. 
Those folks who have been monitored for an extended period of time, let's say 12 months or more, we're going to start reviewing those first to see which monitors can come off of defendants and then work our way down from there. The goal is to get to a point at which monitors are not placed on individuals for more than six months. So that's, that's our current kind of plan as we transition to the new vendor if that is approved by the board. Thank you. All right, uh, the motion on the floor is to approve uh, 0274. Um, Commissioner Abdul Rockman, Vice Chair, followed by Commissioner Barrett, and followed by Commissioner Turner. Something we haven't, we haven't laid everything out right because there's a, there was a, not a protest, but on the bidding. No, that'll be on the next one. Those comments. All right, Commissioner Abdul Rockman. I'm confused, Chairman. Are we not taking both of them together? Or are we doing them separately? No, we, we're going to take, we're going to vote on each one separately. They're talking about them together. But two now, Mr. Votes. Chair, what we voted on was to, to vote on them together. Yeah, we, we heard and voted on together. That was what was approved. Our point of order, or maybe we get the clerk to read it back. I believe the motion was that they be read together no. or heard together. Let, let, let's pull the tape. Let's get somebody to read it back. I have um, Commissioner Abdul Rahman, Vice Chair, made the motion to have them heard together. And heard together is not no. vote together. No, I, I, made, I made the motion to have them heard and voted on together. Point of order, voted on was not in there. It was heard together. No. All right, let's, let's hear them together. Uh, we're going to vote on, vote on them separately. Yes, I've heard. Yes, I'm overruled. Now, let's, let's talk about the, the, what is that? Madam Clerk, I do have a They're playing the tape back. It, it just said, heard that together. Madam Clerk, I am here. We can't really hear that, so whoever's playing it back may need to turn the volume up and rewind it. I think the chair right. has ruled yeah. that well, they're going to be I have voted on order. separately. I have a point of order, and, and they were specifically to be heard and voted on together because Commissioner Barrett explicitly asked Commissioner Arrington why would you object to that? And he said, because I might want to vote for one and not for the other. Okay? So that is what I asked for. That's what the motion was, and that's what we voted on. If you want to overrule it and change it, that's your prerogative, but that's what, that's what I motioned. That was what was seconded, and that's what we voted on. All right, I can't, stop. I can't hear that, so stop. Stop this, please. Thank you. All right, my role ruling once again is we're going to point of hear, order. Yeah. Sorry, I just have a, a parliamentary question because the, while I agree with the, you know, what everybody just said about what went down here, th this feels like a material change to an agenda item. So, I mean, if you're if you're combining two things together, isn't that effectively a new agenda item? And if it is, then shouldn't that require a supermajority? I mean, I. It, there was what was presented to us on paper, and what we approved at the beginning of the meeting was to vote on these two things separately. So I'm just I'm just not sure when we have to get things approved ahead of time and when we don't to make these changes. So I'm, it's just a question. All right, on this particular item, once again, I'm ruling that we're going to hear these and vote on these separately. Is there a motion to overrule me? Is there a motion to overrule me? Thank you. Now let's put this in context. It's my understanding, Mr. Manager, that there were, that the Teletrax submitted a bid on this item. Madam uh, uh, Purchasing Director, can you explain what happened and the disqualification and so forth so we all have the same information? So we're on um, 240275, uh, the initial one. Yes, um, yes, sir. 
Um, this was a competitive seal proposal. We received four proposals. Uh, the proposals were from a second chance monitoring company, um, Allied Universal Electronic, uh, Electronic Monitoring, ANA All County Monitoring, a Teletrix company, and Tyler Technologies. Uh, all four were reviewed by the evaluation committee. Um, it was shortlisted to two firms. Two firms were invited in for oral interviews, discussions. The evaluation committee um, elected to, um, their recommendation was the firm, um, a second chance monitoring that you see here. There were two firms invited. Who was, who was the second one? A and A. A and A, all county monitoring, and a second chance okay. were the two shortlisted firms. Okay. They both were um, invited to the oral interviews and the product demonstrations. The evaluation committee, um, based on their scoring, the top ranked proponent would, would be, is a second chance. Uh, you're speaking to uh, the issue that we had on a, um, a member of ANA contacting David Summerlin. Uh, as the county knows, we have a no contact provision for the county that says that you cannot contact anyone during a procurement uh, other than the purchasing agent and the purchasing agent's representative. Our RFP speaks to that in many places. Um, a contact was made. Um, the basis of the contact was about invoices. It did have some other information in it. After reviewing it and the timing, I elected to, I did send a disqualification, I'm sorry, a disqualification letter to the firm because the no contact provision does not give me discretion. Uh, however, after um, some review with the county attorney's office and the uh, response from their counsel, I elected to uh, withdraw that um, because at this point in time, um, the ANA is not the recommended proposal. So that's how this happened in a nutshell. And who submitted the lowest price? Which firm? This, this is not a uh, this is not a bid. It's I understand a competitive that, but who, sale proposal. But I understand that, but who submitted the lowest price? The lowest price was submitted by ANA, okay. and as you see, they got the they received the twenty five points. So this is on a hundred point scale. There are other evaluation factors, which is why it is a competitive sale proposal. Um, yes, they submitted the lowest price, and they got the highest score for that price. Okay. All right, uh, Vice Chair Abdul Rockman, Commissioner Barrett, Commissioner Thorne, Commissioner Natalie Hall. Motion on the floor is to approve 0274. Okay, I, I have two questions. My first question, um, <clears throat> and I just need an answer as close as possible. If we are transitioning, is there a point where we will stop allowing Teletrix to put the monitors in place? in order to make sure there is a smooth cutoff, such as are we doing it up to a certain date? Are they still doing it now? What is the cut cutoff for to make sure that they do not provide it to anybody else? If I may, commissioners, mm -hmm. uh, currently ANA does have an extension contract with us that goes through April 30th. Okay. Um, so any new ones, we will have to talk to them uh, about those. Um, if this is approved today for a second chance, there is a contract execution period that we have to go through where they'll have to sign the contract because they cannot start work until a contract is executed by both parties. That includes the county and them. And so there will be a little transitioning there, but they do currently have a um, extension for 30 days. And we also have another extension on for the transition of the new services. Um, but we don't want anyone to be caught in between. The new contract hasn't been signed. We have the current provider. If there are some uh, participants that need to be put on ankle monitors, you know, we, we kind of still have to provide the service. So there will be some 
um, transitioning that we're going to have to do and we'll have to work with um, David's office and Mr. Nowaki to make sure that we're doing it in a, uh, um, I'm not sure, fashion. <laughs> Seamless fashion. Well, well, I know with anything that you, you've got to kind of have an ABC plan, but my concern, and clearly you all are the subject, subject matter experts, that's why I'm asking. What plan do we have in place to make sure that we do not pass whatever uh, optimal date that you all have that the current provider will no longer be taking new people? I guess that's my question. Do we have a fail safe been plan? Do we have a date exactly? What are we proposing for that date to be? And has that been communicated to the current provider not to take any more after a particular date? Um, Commissioner, we can't communicate anything to the current provider until the board takes action today to either um, award the current contract or, I mean, award um, the 240275. After this point in time, uh, after the board takes actions today, then we will uh, reach out and we will start um, doing that transition. And we um, can keep the board uh, abreast of how that transition is going once the contract is signed by a second chance, if the board approves that today. Okay, well, let me... Let me reword my question. <laughs> Once upon, and if it is approved, upon uh, BOC approval, we, will we communicate to not take any more? I guess that's what I need to know. Chair. <laughs> I guess what I would say to that is that um, part of the overall plan is to, is to actually document all of the dates that will mm -hmm. be necessary to get through the transition, that will be one of the dates that we will document. The date that um, <clears throat> a second chance will take over um, the um, process of placing new participants or clients, I'm not sure what the right word is, on a electronic monitoring device. So that will be one of the many dates that we establish as part of the, um, the global transition plan. And yes, it will be communicated to um, both parties. Okay. And my last uh, question in here, I'm just playing devil advocate, uh, which I don't like to play, but I do need to ask the question. Uh, ultimately, we would hope that everybody would play fair or doing the transitioning. If in chance, if per chance, and I'm just saying per chance, I'm not saying they will, if our current vendor does not want to participate in the transitioning, do we have a fail-safe backup plan, county manager? That's my only other concern. Uh, not yes, saying that they would, but I'm just asking. Yes, ma'am, uh, we do. But it will uh, be smoother if both vendors work in a cooperative manner over the next 30 to 45 days to complete it. But we do have a backup plan. Okay, thank you, County Manager. Uh, Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I got my question answered, but I'm just gonna take what Vice Chair Abdur Rahman said and take it one step further. Um, I'm assuming because this uh, 0245, I'm sorry, 0274 is a an extension of the existing contract, there is no particular wording in that contract that talks about a transition plan. Is that correct? In the extension, the correct. extension will specifically be for the transition to our car so that a second chance can start doing it 100%. Um, we just did not want to their current, um, Teletrax's current extension expires on April 30th. Um, we're not sure that the new firm or the, the new provider would be able to do the total 100% transition. And so we just wanted to have a plan B so that if that does not occur, that we have a plan B and there is no one out there not being monitored. I got you. I think what I'm trying to ask, and maybe I didn't ask it well, is do we have something in writing 
or will we, following this meeting, have something Absolutely. in writing that not only commits them to a contract of a length of time, but to participate in the transition process? Absolutely. Okay, got it. Um, and also, uh, Mr. Naraki, uh, Naraki, sorry, I think you, it seemed like you wanted to say something else for clarification, so I just want to give you the opportunity if there was something you wanted to add. No, ma'am, thank you, Commissioner Barrett. I think uh, Ms. Strong Whitaker summarized it well, but thank you, ma'am. Okay, got it. Um, last question, with the, any new monitors that go on before all of these um, I's are dotted and T's are crossed and signatures are on pages, do we at least have a commitment that they will be the newer technology so that they will be switched over as a software only uh, transition? Yes, that will be in the contract specifically, okay. yes. Perfect, thank you. Commissioner Thorne. Yes, on that, on that same point, um, I, I was unaware that we had old technology and new technology. Um, and I think it would be good moving forward with just one technology um, that will be a positive with this new vendor. Um, I do appreciate uh, going through the whole RFP process. Um, as we know, you run a very good program over there, uh, Felicia. So I appreciate you going through all that trouble so that everybody had a chance, everybody had an opportunity, and the vendor was awarded the correct contract. So. Uh, I just want to thank everybody on the work that they did on making the process fair. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So first, I'd like to hear the story about the disqualification and then the requalification and the question about the invoices and all of that because it was a bit confusing. I apologize, uh, Commissioner. Um, I can be very specific about dates, if you would like. Um, on 4-8, um, Mr. Summerlin, who is an evaluation committee member, was evaluation committee member, received an email, um, and he forwarded that email to me. As you know, the county has a no-contact provision from the time that the RFP is issued until the recommendation is on the board. The county manager places the recommendation and it is posted on the, the agenda the Friday before the, the Wednesday's meeting. Um, this uh, correspondence happened during that no contact window and um, the, the code does not give me a lot of discretion. However, there was some questions, there was a sentence about invoicing on, on the email. It said some other things, but there was also a question about invoicing. I reviewed it initially. I, I disqualified them. Um, their counsel came back um, and said, well, there was some back and forth. So I reconsidered that, and I withdrew the disqualification so that this could move forward. So what were the other questions? They were pertaining to the bid? Uh, the second paragraph, in my estimation, did pertain to the solicitation. If he had only asked questions about the past due invoices, because we have this all the time. We have contractors who have current contracts with the county, and they also are submitting a proposal to the county. They cannot talk to anyone about the solicitation that they are proposing on, but if they have a current, current contract, they can do business as usual, ask about their invoices, they can do those kind of things. But you can't mix the two. Okay, so the other questions were pertaining not to their current contract at all, they were pertaining to the upcoming bid. Yes. Okay, that's more clear. And then um, what uh, happened with this, the uh, score sheets, why were they, um, submitted so late? So initially, as you know with Legisar, you have to have everything in in order for it to be on the agenda. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, it was placed on the agenda. I had not withdrawn the disqualification. So they were disqualified. So the only person you would have seen was um, a second chance because it was only two shortlisted firms. Once, we, once I decided to, after consultation to withdraw it, I put the other um, shortlisted firm score for everyone to see 
on the agenda. Okay, and you said this is not um, a low bid contract? No, uh, they're, they're, I'm sorry. That's okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead. And this is an RFP, mm -hmm. and in an RFP, there are several evaluation uh, factors. Uh, for instance, on this one, um, there was their approach, which included their equipment specifications, their transition plan, they had to do a product demonstration, their staffing plan, their maintenance and support, equipment repairs, response time, how they retain and store our data, um, qualifications of key personnel, relevant project experience. Um, what are you reading from? Because my score sheet doesn't say all of that. So the score sheet uh, under project What's approach includes all of those factors. So you should have on your score sheet, your score sheet is like a summation. So you're going to have on your score sheet, I'm sorry. Um, this score sheet, well, this says evaluation committee recommendation letter date April 11, 2024. On the third page, Commissioner, is the detailed score sheet, is the score sheet, project approach, qualifications of key personnel, relevant project experience, availability of personnel, local preference, service disabled, and cost. I don't have that. That um, should be the third sheet. Under attached. 275? Yes, attached to the evaluation committee letter. It, it should be three pages. I don't have that. So was this provided later? Uh, it was also in the original um, package. The only thing well. I have is this, this one page that has only second chance on it and has the weights. If you have the evaluation recommendation letter, it should ha have three pages attached to it. I don't, I don't know how that happened. Okay. But um, this was pulled, um, oh, thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. This was pulled right after uh, everything was submitted on Friday. Oh yeah, I don't have that. So is this what was added later? The, the initial evaluation committee page uh, package was there, but it only had one firm's name on it. Okay, that's what I have. One that only has second chance monitoring on it. So this was added later? Right, but the, the initial one should have had three pages as well. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. I didn't get that. With the details. So portion. now I see what you're talking about yes, now. Okay. Um, so. Wait, what, what did they win by? It looks like one point something. Correct, mm -hmm. that is correct. They won by one point something And if you different. look, um, coming out of technicals, the top ranked proponent was a second chance on the cost proposal because um, Talic Trexas had the lowest cost, they, they got, they received the two the full 25 points. That's how the RFP process works. All right, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Commissioner Arrington. When, what day again was the disqualification letter sent? The disqualification letter was sent on April 10th. On April 10th, okay. The email was sent on April 8th. Okay, so April 10th, that was last week, the same day as our board meeting. Correct. Okay, and then when were they, when did you rescind the disqualification letter? I rescinded it on, I believe it was yesterday. Yes, yesterday. I sent an a email on yesterday. I was out of the office on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I was out of town. Um, and so when I got back on Monday, um, Mr. Ash had sent me a, um, 
an email and I reviewed it and uh, on Tuesday I did rescind it. So this item was added to the agenda on Friday and the recommendation was made prior to the rescinding of the disqualification? Yes, the, uh, Commissioner, um, the evaluation committee signed their letter on, um, they signed their letter on April 11th. And as you know, it takes some time for us to get agenda items on. There's a process to get agenda items on for board meetings. And so um, I did disqualify them on April 10th. We had their original uh, evaluation scores from the committee. They made their, um, made their recommendation on April 11th. So the evaluation committee made their recommendation based upon only one vendor because the other vendor was disqualified at the time. No, sir, they had already done their evaluation and completed their, they reviewed the technical. Well, I'm just going off of what you said now. You said you disqualified them on April 10th, they right? Signed. Wednesday, April 10th, mm -hmm. and then you said on Thursday, April 11th, the evaluation committee made their recommendation for the other company. So, so let me if one company was disqualified on the 10th and the evaluation committee made their recommendation on the 11th, that means they could not consider the company that was disqualified on the 10th. So let me back up, Commissioner. I should have said the evaluation committee signed their evaluation committee letter. The evaluation process started um, back in March. As soon as we received the technical proposals, the evaluation committee, which was made up of four people, received the technicals and they reviewed the technical proposals of all four firms. They gave us scores at that time. At that time, it was determined that there, there, we shortlisted because of the scores, the technical scores, to two. Those two firms was the Second Chance and A&A. &A. Both of those firms were invited to oral interviews. The evaluation committee scored their, um, after the evaluation, scored the technicals once again. Once the technicals are totally scored, then and only then can we open cost. We open the cost, the total scores for all those two firms, we've already had all of their total scores. When I disqualified, all my team did was remove the other firm's scores from the evaluation sheet. Once I rescinded it, I put it back. They were already, they had already been scored. That is the process. So I don't know about the procurement process. I'm not involved in it. All I can tell you is it doesn't look right. Now I know Second Chance and Daniel, he's a great guy. But to disqualify one of two vendors prior to making the recommendation and then to rescind the disqualification yesterday after the items were placed on the agenda last Friday, it, it, it just doesn't sound right. It, it, like, hey, second chances, I assume they're good people. I, I know Daniel's a great guy. This doesn't have anything to do with second chance. This has to do with us and our practices and our policies and our procedures. So in my mind, it does not make sense that someone could be disqualified on Wednesday, another party recommended on Thursday, an agenda item placed on Friday based upon the Wednesday disqualification and the Thursday recommendation, and then a Tuesday, April 16th reinstatement. It's just messy. It's real messy. It, it doesn't sound like it was done proper. It does, it's, I mean, like, it's, it's not clean. It's, it, the process was not clean. 
And, and, and so despite the fact that I know Daniel and I know he's a great guy, I'm not going to be able to vote for this based upon that chronology and that timeline and the way it transpired. I don't think that that is proper. Um, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't smell right. Um, and Commissioner, the top rank proponent never changed. The top rank proponent never changed. I, I, hey, I, th that's your area. I, I, I can't speak to that. All I can tell you is it doesn't pass the smell test. It does not pass the smell test to disqualify somebody on a Wednesday, recommend somebody different on a Thursday, print an agenda item on Friday, and then three or four days later on Tuesday, yesterday before today's meeting, to un, to resend a disqualification letter after the item, someone else has already been recommending the item has been put on the agenda. That, that does not pass the smell test. All right, uh, Commissioner Thorne. Alicia, um, did you consult with the county attorney on this? I did. Um, one of the reasons that we reconsidered was um, when I reached out to a and a to ask if they would assist us during the transition um, because their attorney had sent me a, a um, email explaining and asking me to reconsider. They indicated that it depended on our response, whether they would uh, sign and agree to the extension. So that was one of the factors that was considered um, in that this is a really big contract with a lot of participants as part of it, and we did not want to not have a plan A, B, and C. Got it. Um, County Attorney, do you, could you speak to this as well since you did see the letter and made the decision? Um, apparently, uh, Ms. Strong Whitaker may have consulted with someone in my office, but I was not briefed on this prior to. If you would like to hear the contents of the actual discussion, I can ask uh, one of our deputies to come up and address that at this point. Denval, are you <laughs> want to speak to it? My name is Den Val Stewart in the county attorney's office. On this matter, I did not deal directly with Ms. Strong Whitaker um, directly on this issue. It was another attorney, but they report to me. So I can flesh out or answer anything that you have, if you have a particular question for me on this. So you were advised to reinstate them on Tuesday or Monday? Well, the, After they, you received a letter from their attorney. Yes, we di what we do is we will consult with Ms. Whitaker because we will make it clear that the decision whether to disqualify belongs to Ms. Whitaker alone in her capacity as purchasing agent and also whether or not she wanted to reinstate them was her decision. Our role in legal would only be to advise her on possible consequences. Um, if she were to take whichever action she decided. And so based on that, she decided, based on the fact that she may have initially had directed them to contact Mr. Summerlin, and that may have at least created the avenue for there to be some gray area as to the purpose for the contact, along with she may have also thought about, like she indicated, about making sure that the there was an extension in place. Um, she decided to reinstate them, but the decision is with the purchasing agent. Yes, but she followed procedures cor correctly, and she has the authority to make those decisions that she made. Uh, yes, she does. She, has, she alone has the decision whether to disqualify, and she alone has the decision whether to reinstate. Great. Um, 
On the uh, evaluation committee recommendation letter, listed here, I only have the um, matrix, the weights for second chance monitoring. I don't have um, A and A. There should have been an updated uh, package that you received um, that had both of the scores, scores on them. Um, if you would like for me to go through the scores, I can do that. Could you just read off quickly, like project approach? Sure. On project approach, the top weight was 35%. A second chance received 35%. ANA received 28.44. On qualifications of key personnel, the top weight was 10%. A second chance received 9.38. Uh, ANA received 7.5. Relevant project experience was 20%. Uh, a second chance received 16.25%. ANA received 16.25%. For availability of uh, personnel, uh, the weight was 3%. And uh, a second chance received 3%. ANA received 2.25%. Local preference was 5%. Both firms received the 5%. On service disabled veterans preference, it was 2%. Neither firm received the 2%. <coughs> On the cost proposal, the top um, weight was 25%. A second chance received 17.71%. And uh, ANA received 25% be because they did submit the overall lowest score, lowest price. Yeah, that, that's what confused me because what we received, um, it says second chance monitoring, that 25%, but that was just based as That was based on better. them being the only okay. one, okay. yes. Now I understand clearly. Um, on another note, um, you mentioned we had, a, um, Steve Norwicki, you, you mentioned we had 1,100 plus people on ankle monitors currently. Yes, ma'am. And you're gonna review so that people stay on ankle monitors try to aim a max of six months. We, we set a cap of 1,518. Has, have we been able to work within that cap? Uh, Mr. Summerlin, Summerlin can correct me, but I believe we have been under that cap since the board approved that, that level of the cap. Okay, And we've great. been hovering around this 1,100 for a couple we months. We haven't had issues um, with needing more, extending more. And, no, ma'am. And in the future, if we really are evaluating people who are only on six months, we shouldn't go beyond that. Yes, ma'am, it's an initiative um, the Superior Court is, is taking very seriously and we have part of our transition plan um, because for those that are within that 12 months, 12 to six months, ideally, instead of having to do a swap, they're just coming in, getting the monitor removed and then they're going on about their business. So it's one less monitor that needs to be attached for any of those in that population. Okay, that's good to hear, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Barrett. Um, I just wanted to speak again because I, I feel like I wanted to summarize everything that's been going on so that we're clear because there have been a lot of um, sort of accusations and questions being tossed about and I, I just want to clear up. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Ms. Strong Whitaker for your work on this. I think it's, um, if I'm following the timeline correctly, um, the, the bid evaluation process went all the way through, essentially, and uh, a second chance was chosen because they had the highest score, correct? Correct, Commissioner. Um, in the meantime, um, Teletrix did a disqualifying thing in that they broke the no contact rule, and therefore you chose to disqualify them. But regardless, they were not going to win the contract because of their score. Correct. Okay, the only reason that we chose to undisqualify them is because there was a potential that they would not sign the extension contract and therefore make this transition harder for us and potentially um, you know, less smooth and maybe some public safety issues. So in order to have a, the smoothest transition possible, you remove the disqualification uh, essentially as a favor to them because it looks better for them to have to go forward into other uh, negotiations without having been disqualified by Fulton County, correct? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to clear all that up. I believe everything you did is above board and, and correct. Um, and if, if there's any smell test that would need to be thought through, it's that A&A, a company, 
was threatening not to transition without us removing the disqualification or the disqualification. So I just want to make that clear. Um, and I want to thank you for your work on this and your patience uh, through this questioning. Commissioner Arrington. I'd like to call the question on 0274. Okay, 0275 is before us. No, sir. Both items were read. There was a motion for them to be heard together. 0274 proceeds 0275 on the agenda. We were discussing and having discussion on both items, and you ruled as the chair that we would vote on them separately, and I just did a motion to call the question on 0274. The scoreboard says 0275 is before us. 0275 is before us. Let's vote on the call of the question. Point of order. My call of the question was not on 0275. 0275 is before us because we heard both items together. She first read 0274, and then she moved to 0275. My motion was for a call of the question on 0274 because you all voted to hear these items together. Madam County Attorney, Madam Parliamentarian, uh, I had ruled that we were going to hear them together, but vote separately. What's before us now is a vote on 0275. What I heard your ruling was, was to vote on them separately, and currently the single item that is up um, on the, uh, that is, has been read and is, is before the board is 0275. Point of order, that is inaccurate. The, the single item that there is a motion on, there's only one motion. I made the motion to call the question on 0274. Okay. Madam Clerk, did you read 0274 prior to reading 0275? Yes, Commissioner, I did. All right, I'm going to rule that 0274 is not before us. 0275 is before us, and I'll entertain a motion to overrule. I'm going to make a substitute motion to hold. OK, Mr. Chairman, we have a couple of motions already in the machine, so we're going to have to clear those out. So now the motion on the floor will be for Commissioner Arrington's hold. Yes, yeah, substitute motion to hold or to table this item. Which one, Commissioner? Sir, you just ruled that 0275 was the only item before us. That's correct. So how can you ask me which one if you just made a ruling that that was the only item before us? I also ruled that the motion to uh, the, the call of the question was before us. Let's deal so with my that. call of the question was on 0274. So once you made yeah. a ruling that it was 0275, I then made a substitute motion to hold the table the item. All right, let's deal with the motion to hold 0275. OK, and All I right. need a second, please, for the motion to hold. Is there a second? Is there a second? All right, promptly moved and second. Let's vote on the motion to hold. And the vote is open on the motion to hold. And the motion fails, two yeas, five nays. All right. Now, I'll entertain a motion again on 0275, which was to approve by Commissioner Ellis, seconded by Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. Commissioner Hall wants to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question is for Madam County Attorney. Is it unethical or illegal for a vendor who is up for bid to give a sitting commissioner a fundraiser prior to the bid coming up for a vote? So the 
ethical question. I don't have very many facts surrounding this, and I would have to research it with more facts. The ethical question is something for the Board of Ethics to consider, um, as and illegality is not something that my office considers either. We uh, deal with civil matters that um, that uh, pertain to Fulton County, but not criminal. Thank you. All right, let's vote. Uh, motion is to approve, 0275. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, one nay, one abstention. All right, uh, on 0274, is there a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve on 0274. Is there a second? Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Commissioner Ellis. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And just further question for Mr. Summerlin um, regarding our monitoring of this kind of going forward. Um, I mean, I will say I'm a little disappointed that. The proactive monitoring of this has not seemed to have occurred already. Um, I thought that's the pathway that we were going um, when we had this discussion, I want to say back in October, November, um, in an acknowledgement by the court that and the judges that, um, that this has sort of grown out of control and that there was going to be more aggressive monitoring of it. Um, so I, I guess what I'm looking to hear from you um, is that the Superior Court is serious about this and will be doing it, and how will we be, how will this be reported back to us that that indeed is occurring? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is my mic on? Yes. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so in October, November, I think there were about 1,500 folks being monitored, give or take, there was about 1,500 mm -hmm. folks being monitored. At that time, we discussed, at that time, we discussed a transition where we would begin to proactively look at those folks that are being monitored mm -hmm. to see which folks could come off, and also at the same time, implement a process by which judges on the front end, when placing folks on electronic monitoring, would limit that to six months. Uh, and with, with only in, in unusual circumstances where the judge needed to come back, Mm -hmm. and, um, and add additional time for that monitoring would that occur, which would be extremely rare. So we did discuss that process. This procurement process has gone on a little bit longer than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. We thought that the cleanest process would, would be once there was a determination on um, a contract moving forward that we would, at that time would sort of begin proactive management mm -hmm. and we're ready to do that. We're starting, we're gathering the information, the data right now and we're, we're prepared to do that. Preparing or we'll be doing it? We will be doing it as, okay. soon as, as soon as we're able to move forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's vote, please. Motion on the floor. Vice Chair, you have the floor. No. All right. The motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes. Six yeas, one abstention. All right, continue, Madam Clerk. Bottom of page five, Commissioner's Action Items, 240247, request approval of a resolution establishing policies limiting the use of Fulton County staff for certain events by members of the Fulton County Board of Commissioners and for other purposes, sponsored by Commissioner Thorne. Commissioner Thorne, you want to explain where we are? This um, was held at the last meeting. Sure. Um, so, Basically, I want to clarify, there are three, as after meeting with um, Commissioner um, Barrett, and by the way, thank you for your courtesy and respect by meeting with me for over an hour the other day. I do appreciate your input that you gave me. Um, uh, Commissioner Ellis, I appreciate you responding, the courtesy and respect you re by responding that you're good. And Commissioner Pitts, you met with me a couple times. And um, also, thank you for saying move on. You, you agree with everything. And then um, Commissioner Abdurrahman, I do appreciate 
the input that you have given me, um, and some of it you have some changes still that you'd like to be made, but um, I just thank you all for responding to my email. I sent an email out with times that we were available Friday, Monday and Tuesday, virtually or in person, and so I do thank you all. Um, the problem that wasn't really quite clear to the public, I think, is there are three types of events. There are events that the department heads do, and it's part of their responsibilities of doing community engagement. They budget for it. They plan for it. And then there's a second one that's kind of an intermediate where they they have an event going on in a commissioner's district and they'll ask the commissioner to come on and help promote their event to be a part of their event. So they're kind of collaborative events. And then the third kind is a commissioner-driven event. The commissioner wants to do an event. They contact the various departments and try to get their event arranged using county staff. So this particular item only, and I stress only, applies to commissioner-driven events. So in these commissioner-driven events, the first one, there's been no changes. Commissioners shall prioritize using their own staff to support events. The second one, uh, commissioners, it, as uh, Commissioner Arrington stated, it is campaign season out there. And commissioners need to avoid the appearance of using county staff and facilities for campaign purposes. Um, public outreach is primarily the job of our individual departments and departments of external affairs. Although we do do outreach, that should not be our primary job of just hosting events. So if you ask what your commissioner is working on and they say, I'm working on this event, this event, this event, we need to be working on the policy and the running of the county and really diving in and trying to find solutions and problems that way. Our job is not to primarily host events. Uh, individual commissioners, we added this uh, wording a little bit better, individual commissioners should generally collaborate and join the efforts of individual departments rather than schedule their own outreach events on behalf of the departments. Thirdly, commissioners shall provide and request staff support in writing a minimum of 14 days. I think there were some uh, issues there that somebody didn't think it was 14 days. Um, but the, with the exception... Um, of external affairs and DREAM, they need 30 days notice, primarily for publicity of events and for equipment and uh, facility usage. Fourth, a commissioner sh shall not request county staff for one more than one event per month that takes place at a non-Fulton County facility or after normal working hours. Um, Libraries that their normal working hours are different than most of the others. So uh, libraries are open on Saturday, so events are welcome to be held there. That's considered normal working hours. Um, the after working uh, hours provision applies to events held at both Fulton County facilities and non-Fulton County facilities. Any events that occur during the normal working hours should not interfere with normal departmental budgets or operations. The fifth one, county staff participation in scheduling is subject to the direction of the department head, not at the direction of the individual commissioner. We need to work with our departments. We don't need to be mandating their scheduling and their participation. Six, commissioners shall not expect county staff to attend or provide supplies, materials, and equipment to any event a municipality government agency other than Fulton County Nonprofit or commercial organizations such as the vendor fairs, MPU meetings, town halls, grand openings, and ribbon cuttings. And th this is primarily for supplies, materials that we request specifically for our events. A lot of our departments come and they bring, because they, they are doing their outreach and they already have 
um, materials that they normally bring and, and goodies. I know Samir, when he came, he treated all of the uh, students that came down here, Student Johns Creek, with socks, and it was quite a hit. But it was nothing, it was a surprise to me, but it really made the event great. Seventh, county staff shall not be used to boost coverage of commissioners' attendance at third-party events for purposes of this section. A third-party event is defined as an event that is not held or funded by the county department or where the event is not approved, held or supported by the full board of commissioners. County staff should also not be requested to prepare materials or goodie bags for commissioners to take to third-party events. And then we added this eighth one, um, just to really clarify again, uh, department heads may involve county staff supplies, materials, and equipment subject to their individual discretion in alignment with departmental goals. Department heads are not obligated to support commissioner events when it would interfere with their normal operations and goals. So basically, I am... I am not profiting from this. This is not something that um, I enjoy doing, um, but I see it as a need for our, our county mission and our staff to be used wisely. Um, I also want to take note that I did reach out to Mr. Fan, who came down here. Somehow the messages we left him got lost in his voicemail, um, but I do welcome public input as well as commissioner input, as well as the department input. I'm trying to get everybody's input and draft a solution that's best for everyone. All right, let's get a motion on the floor. Is there a motion? Motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Vice Chair Abdul Rahman. Vice Chair, you have the floor, followed by Commissioner Arrington, Commissioner Thorne, Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief in my comments. Um, Thank you for holding this. Um, I was the one that put the hole in place because I believe that it needed to be fleshing out. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Barrett for meeting with you. Um, I think sometimes we get caught up in the politics of stuff and we don't understand that all of us are down here to legislate. It's not a matter of whether you necessarily agree with the person, but you need to find common ground. And the only way you're going to have common ground is to have a conversation. You can't find common ground if you have decided not to ever speak to the person or not ever return calls or not ever uh, uh, do your due diligence as an elected official to meet. Uh, we do the taxpaying citizens of Fulton County a disservice when we come down here and politicize something and then when all the lights, camera, action is gone, we don't even try to meet with our colleague. And so let me just say that. I would like to make a friendly amendment. I want to change the requesting county staff for one event per month to six events per quarter. I feel like that is fairer to me. Um, not saying that the other one's not fair, but just making sure that we do something that across the board should be, you know, uh, adequate for all the commissioners. And also I want to read in the record that I want to clarify that point six does not pertain to supplies, an example, brochures, and giveaways that have already been purchased by the departments. This point pertains to departments making special orders for commissioner's event for additional supplies. We have to have continuity. We had a transportation um, for the commissioners that was abused, uh, unfortunately, we went through what I would call some rockingness in it, but at the end of the day, we did away with the transportation. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but I accepted it because I understand there was abuse. Anytime that you have abuse with the issue, it must be addressed, and unfortunately, in these cases, we need to put in black and white what the expectations are and what it speaks to, so I would hope uh, um, uh, Commissioner Thorne, that you would accept my friendly amendment, and I just want to go on record making sure that we clarify that in six, the point pertains only to departments making special orders for commission events for additional supplies. 
Um, I'll accept your amendments, um, and we'll just see how it goes. And then we, we do, uh, Commissioner Barrett and I did think that we need to have another round of, this is just a preliminary, and we need to have another round of going. So we'll just see how this works for now um, and discuss in our next retreat what we need to do moving forward. Uh, Commissioner Arrington. I guess I want to start out by asking about number eight again, because there's no number eight on my, in my booklet, nor on our online system. It only goes through one through seven. Um, I disagree with the underlying premise that there are only three events, department events, and whatever those three areas uh, that were listed. There are also community events that are hosted by the community where the community reaches out and requests services. So that is at least a fourth type of event. The public who we are here to serve can call and request and that to have staff, to have people come to a voter registration event where we provide voter registration, to provide the, uh, the mobile clinic where, we, where they take blood pressure and do all those types of things. So there are more than those three type of events. So the, the underlying premise that there are only three type of events is flawed. Um, Later, it's also number four says, start uh, commission strong request staff for one event per month that takes place at a Fulton County facility or after normal working hours, i.e. a start time of 5 p.m. or later, anytime on Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday. But our libraries are open on the weekends. And so obviously, that language right there is contradictory in and of itself because their normal working hours could be on a Saturday or a Sunday. So that language is contradictory in and of itself and makes it vague and ambiguous because is it working hours or if it's a Saturday or Sunday? So, um, You know, there, there are also other events, um, and so, let me see where I lost. Uh, I lost my place, but um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to support this. Um, I believe that perhaps there may be some reasonable efforts that are needed. I don't, I believe that this falls short. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to support it. Um, even with the friendly amendment. Um, the, oh, MPU meetings and events, and town hall meetings. Um, in the city of Atlanta, the MPU meetings are the meetings with the highest attendance. And so the idea that we would limit staff from attending MPU meetings is illogical. Um, we, since I've been here, um, we've attempted to hold various 
town hall meetings on various subjects and attendance has been low. And I found that doing that at the MPU meetings where there's already high attendance is the best place to provide the information rather than trying to create our own event or our own hearing or notice or uh, public hearing. Um, it's always better to go, especially in the city of Atlanta, uh, to the MPU meetings and to provide information there. Um, so, uh, and, and what was number eight again? No, I don't, I don't number, this is what's in my folder. It's got one through seven. Yeah. The document online that we have here on this pad has one through seven as well. Thank you. You done, Commissioner? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Commissioner Thorne, you want to be heard again? Yeah, I just wanted to respond that the, um, since we had a meeting a week ago, it was a bit hard to do the turnaround and accommodate and get all the changes done and everything. So, um, Commissioner Arrington, I apologize um, that we placed it in your mailbox on Monday, and it was on your add-on folder on your desk. Um, I'm sorry that you missed it. Um, again, I'm appreciative to everybody who reached out to me and did collaborate with me, and I hope we can collaborate more together. I really enjoyed it. Um, and community, in regards to community-driven events, if someone came to me and I'm requesting um, like, I, it would be really great if the library attends that event. I would certainly put it out to the library. Hey, you know, we have a great event. There are going to be 200 people there. Can you come and let the department heads try to see if they can fit it in their schedule to come? Because what's good for the community um, is also good for our department heads. And as a commissioner, I'm happy to make connections. But I don't need to be the face at that event saying um, on behalf of the, you know, I brought the libraries, I brought this. I don't need to take credit um, as a commissioner. So I certainly encourage community-driven events to reach out to your commissioners if they need um, information about the county. And I'm certain all of us would be willing to provide that. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Thorne, um, thank you for, you know, um, offering to collaborate with everybody, and I appreciate you taking the time um, to listen to my um, requested changes and to incorporate a good number of them. I really do appreciate that, and I do think um, to respond to um, some of Commissioner Arrington's concerns, adding number eight that that was new, I think really does address a lot of those concerns. And I'm just going to read it out loud again: Department heads may involve county staff, supplies, materials, and equipment subject to their individual discretion and alignment with departmental goals. Department heads are not obligated to support commissioners' events when it would interfere with their normal operations and departmental goals. And I think the point of that is, and I, I think it may get at one of your amendments a, a little bit, Vice Chair, in that if the department wants to come, if external affairs thinks it's a great idea or voting thinks it's a, you know, Department of Registration Election thinks it's a great idea to, you know, bring materials or supplies or swag or whatever it is to a particular event and it's aligned with their mission, they can do so. So it's not forbidding them to bring those things to an NPU meeting or for them to show up to that if it's aligned with their goals. So I think, I think that number eight really does clear up, clarify this and allow some of those things that are beneficial to the community uh, and to respond to neighbor, neighborhood requests and things like that. So I, I do think that line item is super helpful. Uh, I do have a concern about the change to, from one a month to six a quarter, the friendly amendment. Um, that'd be two a month. 
But saying six a quarter, I think, takes away from what you may have been trying to accomplish um, based on our conversation, Commissioner Thorne, and that the whole idea about, you know, putting a whole bunch of events at one time and, you know, can look, can sort of not pass the smell test of it looking like it's campaign related. So all of a sudden, if somebody's doing a whole bunch of events, you know, six events now, if you change it to this amendment in, in May or in April, then it would, it would smack of that campaign situation. So that is concerning to me. Um, I'd be more comfortable with making that two a month versus one a month, although I personally think one a month is more than enough. Um, I also want to just share with everybody else some of the conversations we had. I, I, I stick by what I said last week in that I would love for us to have taken this up sort of together at the um, next retreat meeting, which um, I know we've now pulled for dates and are getting that scheduled, so I'm thankful uh, for that. But, um, and hopefully we can continue the conversation, but I think we had some very positive conversations about um, what else we can do longer term to sort of address some of these issues. And um, I, I, I want to just express that it, it's always helpful, I think, to know, to quantify the problem we're trying to solve. And I think right now we're all trying to solve a problem based on anecdotal evidence. We've heard this, we've heard that, we've seen this, we saw an ad for an event, that kind of thing. So I, I hate to drag you into this, uh, Mr. County Manager, but um, I think we need to find a way, and sooner than later, to track the requests. So right now it feels like commissioners are making requests to various departments. There's no central um, location for requests to go through, so I don't know if that should be going through uh, our clerk or if it should be going through external affairs or something, but there needs to be some sort of hub where requests come through and then some sort of tracking so that we know and we can get some kind of regular reporting on events that are scheduled, events that have occurred. Um, uh, uh, you want to respond? I feel like you do. No? <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say, well, Dr. Rochelle took the lead on that, but the, our last discussion was to create a portal that would allow you to enter in requests, track them, you know, see any uh, resource utilization. So we'll, we can report back in the next meeting uh, okay. on that. Yeah, I think in a perfect world, it is all um, in a system and it is quantified in terms of cost and all of those things. So I think this is, overall, I think this is a really good first step to try to rein this in a little bit, but I would love to be able to um, quantify, again, the cost and what we're doing here and, and also just have a view into what's happening um, because there is, you know, one of the downsides of doing something like this, unfortunately, this is true for a lot of the rules that apply to commissioners, and we're going to get into this more later um, with some of the other issues, I think. But the enforcement mechanisms are, are challenging. So at least if we have visibility, we may or may not be able to say, well, you know, this rule says this. There's some discretion, right, on whether an event qualifies as one thing versus another. On the other hand, if we can see that one commissioner is really abusing or two commissioners or three are particularly abusing um, the resources, then we have more basis from which to act. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add that, and I look forward to continue to working on this. And so I'm not sure that I can support it because of the friendly amendments, but I appreciate the, the, the general work, and I hope to continue it. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to go to number three, and this is part of the revised uh, resolution. Um, at the last meeting, I um, asked Dick about the fact that he had stated 14 days was sufficient for, uh, what is this, the to provide for, within 14 days notice for external affairs and DREAM, and it still says 30 days on here. Is this is that not being updated or changed? Yes, ma'am. I think what uh, the original was 30 days. Then we, uh, in conversations with Commissioner Thorne and her staff, said we could do 14. And in the, if I recall, in the context of the conversation, said, well, if there's something like the mobile stage or you know some logistical support, that's why Dream is on here. Perhaps it would be better to have a 30-day notice. And then, Jessica, I don't recall if we consulted with you, but there was a question about 
in order to have, if it was FGTV or someone like that there, 30 days would be preferred. But let me let you speak to that one. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Rochelle spoke with me, and I did tell her that for us to support an event for which we are providing publicity, um, that, we, that 14 days is not sufficient to develop the materials, um, seek approvals, and then provide adequate notice to the community. And so that's where 30 days came from. OK, so the 30 days remains. Can I comment? The 30 days remains just for external affairs and drain. Speaking to the mic. Uh, right? I heard her. It, just for the two departments. We did initially, um, when we were planning, we, we, went, we had 30 days for everything. Then we thought, well, that's a little long. We'll do 14 days. But then they came back. And in the last meeting, we didn't really change anything from the last meeting here. We just kind of clarified the reasons why external affairs needs 30 days and why DREAM needs 30 days. But it's, it was there last week. It's 14 days for everything else, just 30 days for those two, two departments. All right, and um, I think it's an absolutely great idea to have a portal to track resource utilization. Is, uh, when would that be done? Is there an estimated time of completion? I don't have it today, but I'll, I promise I'll get that back to you. I don't, I don't recall if Dr. Rochelle already had kicked something off. Do you recall, Sharon, for that? I, I don't know. We had the conversation. I'm not sure we initiated something yet with IT. Okay, and um, so this doesn't address how NPU, neighborhood, business, and civic associations, and other organizations should make their request. Um, I've been here 13 years now, six with Commissioner Garner as her chief of staff, and seven, this is my seventh year as a commissioner. And we were told from the beginning, back when I was chief of staff, that they needed to make a request through their commissioner, and then the commissioner make the request unknown to the department. So what is the process now? So now the process is that you just, whatever um, staff they want there, you can submit the request, but the department head could say, no, sorry, it's not an official, it's not a commissioner-driven event. So it's left up to the department head. If it fits their mission, it fits, aligns with their goals, aligns with their schedules that they have, and it doesn't interfere with the current work they're doing, then they can accept that. Okay, well, I don't, I don't have very many commissioner-driven events, so I'm, not, I'm trying to really understand. The only commissioner-driven events that I had were uh, approved in the budget, and they were two um, youth conferences that I had before over the past several years, um, and the Joan P. Garner Walk and Health Fair. Those are the only commissioner-driven events I have. So I don't, I'm trying to understand the resolution, because it doesn't really fall under what I do. Well, it's mainly to not uh, have county staff feel like they have to abide by all the events that you're telling them to go to, that they can, they can set their I don't tell anybody schedule. to go anywhere. OK, then you'd probably be fine. All right. And so what is the procedure? Because it's not in this resolution. We don't have a procedure driven. They're going to try to work on developing a portal to do it. For now, you're just going to have to communicate. So we're going to approve this with no procedure. And so how do the community, how does the community know how to move forward with no procedure? You sit there and you uh, berate Nate, Nadine Williams about not having standard operating procedures, but we're going to approve a resolution with no standard operating procedures for the community to know how to move forward with their request. I'm going to go ahead and um, ask that our county manager work on some type of uh, process that we can share with the community so that they know and they're very clear about how to make requests for 
their events and their meetings. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you very much. Vice Chair Abdurrahman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, our goal or our responsibility as, legis as legislators is to legislate. Uh, the county manager deals with processes. And so first and foremost, I would like to say that. Secondly, I would like to say that um, if you say two per month, that still will not work for me. That's why I said six per quarter, because if a commissioner does not need a month, uh, that would allow them the space to have six opportunities. For my particular district, my constituents have a tendency to come out in the warmer months. They come out, they will attend in spring and summer, sometimes even fall, but when the colder months, they won't attend. Uh, and so I have a tendency to have, based on the patterns of knowing my constituents, what are the best times of the year for them to come out. If it goes back to one per month, if the, the commissioner doesn't use it, they lose it. And so I thought in meeting with the commissioner, uh, Thorne, and fleshing this out, here again, I say, as commissioners, we should want to communicate with each other outside of just the BOC. We should want to have a common ground that we meet on. And so the purpose of my friendly amendment was to make sure that the concerns that I was hearing, that I made sure that uh, Commissioner Thorne had. Uh, but Commissioner Thorne did state this is the beginning process. This can, this can be tweaked as we go. But I think this is a good starting point. I'm going to support it. And uh, I'm glad that you accepted my friendly amendment. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, some, several of the comments brought up uh, brought something to mind that uh, Commissioner Thorne and I did uh, speak about, but I want to bring up um, to you, Mr. County Manager. Um, I do think that whatever portal we put together should not be solely for the use of the county commissioners requesting events, but also for all county events. Um, and and I think we should be ha we should have a, a a complete reporting and audit on all county events because. I was looking through the uh, external affairs newsletter. I think it was the most recent one that came out. And I think there were something like 10 events listed there. Um, and, and to Commissioner's Hall, Commissioner Hall's point, there are some events that you know, she initiated, but that have sort of become a routine part of county business now and no longer fall under her department. So I think you know, for the benefit of the taxpayers, we should you know, have a view into how many events the county is putting on, sort of what the purpose of the event is, um, you know, how many people we're serving in that way, geographically where these events are occurring. I mean, I think we should really be able to evaluate overall our events program, if you will. Um, and so that we don't, you know, we can start to ensure that we're not, for example, um, doing a lot of um, health events in one area and none in another area that might need them or something along those lines. And in some cases, different areas need different things. I acknowledge that. But, um, but still, I think there's just not a clear place to go and look um, at overall what events the, the county is doing. And by the way, I think there's also a, a, a who is paying issue because in some cases, they're grant funded. Um, and so we want to be clear on that too, right? Um, but then the staff still has to spend time. And so I think it would just be good to see a comprehensive report um, and probably on some kind of regular basis. Um, and I think having a portal would help that if everybody is using it. So, you know, if, if behavioral health is throwing an event and they need to make a request from Dream for a stage, then that would go through the portal as well. That's my point. Thanks. Commissioner Ellis. Brief. All I'll just say about this is I think it's really hard to codify common sense, common courtesy, and good behavior. Um, I applaud the attempt. I'm going to support it. But I'm not fully convinced that if you don't have a good compass about what it means to be <coughs> appropriate in your ask and not abusive in your ask, 
and not pushy in your ask and, and abuse ask and not um, abusive to the process in general, then we will continue to have <coughs> questions and problems and frustrations held by our staff. Um, you know, so I'll just leave it at that. And also say, no, I'm just going to leave it at that. I get you, sorry to get you choked up, Mr. Chair. <laughs> if I need to do the harm, like, let me know. So we have a motion <laughs> to approve by Bridget Thorne. Um, Vice Chair Khadija Abdul-Amar, second. Clerk, go ahead and call for the vote. And the vote is open. And the motion fails, three yeas, two nays, one abstention. He was then registered chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. On page six. <coughs> oh, hold, hold up for a second. The chairman voted yes. Did it register it? No, we do not have a vote for the chairman. Mr. Chairman, are you voting yes? Yes. So that makes the motion pass with four yeas. Thank you. I want to entertain a motion for lunch and executive session. Please vote. And the vote is open for executive session. And lunch. <laughs> and, lunch. <laughs> and the motion passes, four yeas, zero nays.
Madam Clerk, your people. They ready? All right, without objection, we will resume the regular order of business. Madam Clerk, please continue. On page six, 240276, request approval of an ordinance to amend chapter two, article two, division two of the code of laws of Fulton County to clarify the definition of officer or employee in the code of ethics, sponsored by Commissioner Ellis. All right, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Ellis. It is seconded by uh, Vice Chair Abdu Rogman. Commissioner Ellis, followed by Commissioner Arrington. Yeah, colleagues, really, just really simply, this just amends our, um, um, you know, this particular portion of the code to clarify that the definition of officer or employee shall include, and these are specific words, any elected or, or, or appointed official whose department or agency has is appropriated funds from the county, that they would be subject to the same ethics code uh, that, that we would, for example. So uh, seem to be some lack of clarity around that with um, coming out of some of the ethics codes, ethics boards, um, rulings that they took, and so to me this looked like it needed clarity, so the six to add it. Could, could you repeat that, uh, Commissioner? The, what it does is it clarifies that the definition of officer or employee in the Code of Ethics, it adds this statement. Mm -hmm. This definition shall include any elected or appointed official whose department or agency is appropriated funds from the county. Okay. Commissioner Arrington. There are about 1,000 things that need to be changed in the code of ethics. The priority of changing this one thing is very low. Not only does there, are there 1,000 things that need to be changed in the code of the ethics, the members that comprise the board of ethics need to be removed and the whole board needs to be disbanded and we need to have hearing officers. There's no way in the world that I will support this. Good, Commissioner Barrett. Um, just a question about any potential issues with this. I mean, I, I think this would then incorporate uh, up potentially a lot of people um, that aren't currently included. Is that correct, Madam County Attorney? I'm not sure it would incorporate people who are not currently included. I think it clarifies that they are included. Um, I know there was a recent decision by the Board of Ethics that a certain official was not included. And if it is the intent of this board to include all of the elected officials, then this um, proposed resolution rectifies that or ordinance. Well, just for clarity's sake, um, the issue is whether or not the person who's being brought up on an ethics complaint is a, is, is if their salary is being paid by the county. So I, I guess part of my question is if their salary is not being paid by the county, but their county or agency, or I, I think I read it that way, has um, any funding from the county, mm -hmm. then they would be able to be, you know, those complaints would be able to heard, be heard by our by our ethics board, but I think the question would be like, is that appropriate if it's a state employee or if it's a, some other board? I don't know. I, there's a lot of boards and, and there's a lot of places where Fulton County invests money. So mm -hmm. does a membership, for example, constitute us appropriating funds? So in other words, we pay a membership to um, Atlanta Regional Commission. Is that appropriating funds? Would that subject those folks to Fulton County Board of Ethics? I, I would not expect that to be um, anyone to argue that it would reach to that extent. If a membership is in the nature of a subscription as opposed to appropriating funds to someone's budget, I think this, in my mind, would cover more um, officers that, uh, whose, whose departments receive uh, an allocated budget from Fulton County and perhaps some other situations that don't come to mind at this moment in the abstract. I'm, I'm, I don't have a strong objection to this. I'm just wanting to make sure that we're not sweeping other 
um, that we're not making something that's so broad that we're sweeping other people potentially into this that shouldn't be there. So that's that's what I'm trying to get clarification on. Commissioner, may, if I may, the what it's was clarifying is the definition of officer or employee, which means, quote unquote, as it reads, any elected officer of the county, any person appointed to a county board commission or agency by the board of commissioners, any person employed by the county, including contractual employees, and any person retained by the county or any agency of the county in a consulting capacity. That's the way it currently reads. So this would clarify that that definition would also include any elected or appointed official whose department or agency has appropriated funds from this county. I mean, like I said, I'm really just trying to get, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I understand what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just voicing some concern that we may be sweeping others into this that don't belong here. Commissioner Thorne. I'm gonna call the question. All right, the question's been called. Um, let's, is there a second? Second. Let's vote on the call of the question. And the vote is open on call the question. And the motion fails, three yeas, three nays. Go back to the, Commissioner Arrington. The Fulton County Board of Ethics is a joke. The Fulton County Code of Ethics is a joke. Um, and if, if, the, if this were approved, would it be retroactive or would it be going forward? Most legislation is applied prospectively. Okay, so uh, what, what does prospectively mean? From the point of enactment forward. From the point of enactment forward. So this would be going, for, if it does pass, it would be going forward. It would not be applicable to anything that happened in the past. This one would be a prospective legislation. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, two nays, one abstention. Next item. 240277, request approval of Fulton County anti-nepotism policy, sponsored by Commissioner Ellis. All right, you have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Uh, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, this is a fairly straightforward thing, which is a supplement to our current anti-nepotism policy. Um, and what this supplement would do is that it would uh, ensure that there is um, the same level of treatment for our employees in terms of uh, responsiveness and so forth um, also would extend to elected and appointed officials. So no elected or appointed official whose department or agency has appropriated funds from the county uh, shall engage in or advocate for or be in violation of our, our particular nepotism policy. And um, it's gonna apply to all employees independent contractors, contract personnel, any elected or appointed official whose department agencies, again, has appropriated funds. This is meant to supplement our policy. And in the event there were to be findings of violation of the policy by an elected or appointed official, when we, if there are findings of that, that an elected or appointed official has engaged in a violation of the policy, that is to be reported to us as the Board of Commissioners and it would give us the authority to take action uh, should we choose to do so um, in, in a manner which would include but not limited to issuing a public censure um, or imposing a fine that would be paid by the violator or automatically deducted from the violator's compensation after there was notice and an opportunity to be heard. Uh, so this is just a 
provide certainty to the public that there are, um, that all of us are sort of subject to the same rules as our employees. And if we violate them, that there are potential repercussions associated with those as well. It's not a hall pass. Commissioner Arrington. Too much, too little, too late. Madam County Attorney, would this apply retrospectively or prospectively? Does this apply to things going forward or does this apply to actions that have already, that took place in the past? If approved, this would also be prospective legislation. So what would that mean if something was done pursuant to this policy prior to this being enacted? That would not be a possibility because the policy didn't exist and therefore nothing could have been done pursuant to this policy prior to enactment. Well, they censured Commissioner, Commissioner Hall. Does it, this, the language in this policy prior, to, right now, does not give the Board of Commissioners the opportunity to do any of this, nor does it give the accused the opportunity for notice, which is why it's being put in there now. Was any of that language that is being proposed today, was that in place at the time when they censured Commissioner Hall? First, let me say that the censure Madam County Attorney, that's a yes or no question. And you can't explain after that. I'm sorry, what was the question? Was this language that is being proposed today in there when they went forward to censure Commissioner Hall? No, but that, that implies that it was necessary. It was not in place. But I do want to say that the censure language in this proposed legislation does not require notice and a hearing. That requirement is tied to the um, monetary penalties. Well, it either is there or is not. It says after notice and an opportunity to be heard. Does it not? Doesn't the proposed language say that? Yes, for the monetary penalties, if imposed. Okay. And that language was not there previously, correct? No, this is new legislation. And who is responsible currently for doing this? Who, if there are violations, what, what is the current policy state? Who is responsible for violations of the policy? I, I don't understand the question. Do you mean who is responsible for violations of this policy that's being proposed? Well, this is. So if you mean who was responsible for something like this at that previous time when the board voted to censure Commissioner Hall, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess it was that personnel policy. Who? Who, was, who does that personnel policy identify as the person responsible for being able to take action? I would have to look at it, but I, that action was not taken pursuant to the personnel policy because the personnel policy, uh, this board is, is not able to take disciplinary action against another commissioner. And that was not disciplinary action. It was an expression of an opinion of of certain members of the board. That personnel policy identifies the county manager as the sole arbiter of that personnel policy, doesn't it? Perhaps, I'd have to look at it again. That sounds correct. It sounds correct, I thought so. Thank you. Commissioner Barrett. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple things. Uh, there's some wording, I think, that needs to be reconsidered, potentially, um, for clarity. Um, or maybe it's just a grammatical error, but um, certainly on page, I guess it's 177 according to what I'm looking at, in uh, the first item, item one, statement of policy purpose, the wording is currently, it is the policy of Fulton County to ensure effective supervision, internal discipline, trust, and positive morale in the workplace and seeks to avoid. I think the word seeks just needs to come out. It should say and to avoid. It is the policy to do X, Y, Z and to avoid, not and seeks to avoid. So that's just grammatical, but I think for clarity it should be, and it's also just more concrete if you take out seeks. Um, the other wording choice I'm questioning, and this may just be me not understanding, so I, it doesn't necessarily need to be changed, but I do need an explanation. On the next page under um, item four where it says violations, in the first paragraph it says, um, 
the county, so there's two paragraphs, right? The first paragraph seems to um, relate to everyone, including employees and what have you, and the second paragraph seems to ap apply to elected and appointed officials. And in that first paragraph, it says the county manager or his slash her designee shall investigate alleged violations of this policy. All findings of violations of this policy by employees shall be reported to the applicable appointing authority. So I'm not clear on who the appointing authority would be in that case. So in the under violations, there are two different scenarios that are possible. If you do have an appointing authority, say you are an employee who reports to a department head or to the county manager, then it would be reported to the person who has disciplinary authority over that employee. Is that referred to as appointing authority in all of our HR policies? Oh, yes. Okay. So um, the well second then, paragraph is the other scenario. If correct. you have no appointing authority because essentially, for example, the voters are the ones who have put you in office and not an individual within Fulton County. Right, I understood that. Then you would, you would default to the second paragraph. Okay, that's fine. So I just think then it's that first word in that first paragraph and it probably needs to just come out. Um, I'm not gonna change my vote based on that one way or the other. I just think it should be fixed. Um, but I do have a question about going forward on this right now. And my question relates more to the violations, um, you know, to the punishment essentially, which is that um, we are saying we can issue a fine but I don't see a fine schedule attached. Do we have such a thing? That could be something that uh, this policy allows for the county manager in conjunction with my office to come up with um, procedures that match the policy. So it's something that you could insert as the board or you could delegate to um, the departments. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but it's if this passes, is it effective immediately? The policy is effective immediately. The enforcement mechanisms would need to be developed and that would take some time. Well, it feels to me like this should be a complete policy including a fine schedule um, and a procedure um, in order to vote for it. Because if you come back with a fine schedule and you say, uh, I'm not saying that you would, but if you come back with a fine schedule and you say it's $60,000 per violation, I'm not going to support that. If you say it's $5 per violation, I'm not going to support that either. That doesn't seem right. Or if it's some way, in some way not fair um, to everybody who commits the same um, act, then, you know, to me it's incomplete without the fine schedule. Saying we can fine somebody but not saying how much leaves it to be pretty arbitrary. So um, I'm going to make a motion to hold until we get that part of this, um, you know, made public and, and um, so that we can approve it all together. All right. Is it a substitute motion to hold? Is there a second on the substitute motion to hold? Is there a second on the substitute motion? It's Arrington. Yes, I did. Oh, Commissioner Arrington. Sorry. All right, the motion on the floor is to hold. Please vote. I'm still in the queue for discussion, Mr. Chair. Okay, you have the floor, Commissioner. And so is uh, Commissioner Thorne. All right, Commissioner Thorne, this, now we're on the motion to hold. Commissioner Thorne. Um, as with a fine schedule, that would be have something that would require a tremendous amount of work because you'd have to think out of based on a person's salary, because this is across the county, across different salary schedules. So like one fine may be punitive to someone, but not very punitive to another in the county. Um, and I think we maybe just approve it um, and have it enacted once a, the fine schedule is developed. And so that I would make a motion or a friendly amendment that we would implement it once how we're going to impose the fine and the fine fees is established by the county manager and his staff and brought forward to us. The, the motion on the floor now is to hold. See, I don't think they can, I, I don't think between our next meeting they're going to be able to develop that. So I think we need to go ahead and put the policy in place. And then, yes. And then just deny the hold. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Arrington? I think that this needs to be held. How would how would we receive 
or how would anyone receive notice of the fine schedule once ad adopted by the county manager or county attorney? How would any employee or commissioner or elected official, how would they receive notice of it? How would you know what the fine is going to be? How would you know? So two possible ways that you would uh, receive notice is uh, constructive or actual notice from it being codified once it is developed. And the other way is that presumably when the individual received notice um, of the hearing and opportunity to be heard, they would receive um, that information as well. Well, codified, that's what they're trying to do right now. So that, 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 that doesn't answer the question because if, if they codify it right now, if this gets passed right now, you guys have the county manager, county attorney, and others, chief operating officer would be responsible for coming up with a fine schedule. So then when and where would that fine schedule be presented? Would it have to come back to this board to be approved? It's that, that level of detail is de delegated to the county manager um, to develop in conjunction with our office, but it's also posted on the county's website along with all of the other policies and procedures that pertain to our employees and officials. Posting on the website is not notice, ma'am. Notice is a constitutional requirement. Notice of the hearing is a requirement when there is a requirement for hearing, but notice of a law can occur just by having the law being passed and being on the books. I would submit to you that people need to have notice of a fine schedule and they need to know what the fines are, are going to be or possibly would be. And that if you do not provide them that notice, you are depriving them of their due process under the law. Okay. Mr. Ellis? Yeah, I don't think we need a fine schedule. I think the, the, the policy is clear on its face. It gives us the authority to take action, including but not limited to issuing a public censure, including but not limited to. There could be other actions that we could take. But if we're going to impose a fine, then you know there's got to be notice and an opportunity to be heard. Um, and obviously, it's got to be something that's within the realm of reasonableness and stand the test of legality. So I think the policy is fine as the way it's written. Um, I think you're getting too far down into the weeds to try to ask our attorney or our manager to prescribe a schedule for every type of situation. Um, that should be left to us to determine. That's our, that should be our role. Commissioner Barrett. Um, Commissioner Ellis, is there a particular reason that this is, um, needs to be done this week? Is, it, is there a hurry for this? Um, I see no reason why it shouldn't be done right now. Uh, given some of the events that have occurred within the county, I think it's up to us to provide a response that on a go-forward basis, this is what we stand for. And I think the sooner it's done, the better. Um, in the, interest, in the interest of transparency for the citizens and fairness, um, I think it's very important that we have a fine schedule. With any standard violation of, I mean, a law, generally speaking, there's a fine schedule. If there's a fine that can be levied, there's a fine schedule. So if you, you, know, if you get caught Speeding, you don't just get randomly whatever a dollar amount somebody, some judge feels like giving you. This is, there's no reason why we wouldn't want to do this in a way that is advertised and fair. So the idea that we don't need a fine schedule, I could see if you said we didn't need it now for some reason, but you seem to be saying we don't need a fine schedule at all, which makes no sense to me. We, we have to have some guidelines here because then, you know, if we don't, we're going to be called into question. If two people commit this violation, and one of them gets a $1,000 fine, and I'm talking not, Commissioner Thorne, about uh, an employee versus an elected official. I'm talking about two different elected officials commit this, this violation, and one is fined $1,000, and one is fined $5,000. I, 
then we have made some kind of a arbitrary political decision, which I think is completely inappropriate. So we do need a fine schedule, and it should be with this policy. And the idea that we should just push this through because we want to have this arbitrary power to slap fines on people is untenable. I definitely cannot support it without, I was just asking to hold. Um, I'm still asking to hold because I would still like to see this fine schedule. But you know, if, if that's not even something you're willing to consider adding to it, then absolutely I don't support it. And I will stand on that and, and get as loud as anybody else in this room gets to say this is inappropriate. We should, have, we should be meeting out legislation and creating policies that are fair and that are transparent, and this is neither. Commissioner Ellis. Uh, if that's the position you want to take, knock yourself out. Um, we have human resource policies, you know, in, in our code, right, which we say things like including but not limited to up to termination, right? So yes. with every type of situation, if you've ever managed people, you've worked in an organization, if you want to try to prescribe el every element into a construct of a personnel-like policy, which this is one, you're going to get yourselves in trouble. And there's a reason why years and years of experience in terms of the way that policies and procedures are constructed have this type of language in them. And that's why this is contained here, and that's why I want it here. All right, Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Barrett. Two things. First of all, a point of order on decorum telling me I can knock myself out is inappropriate. Are you going to respond? That's Commissioner Barrett, I apologize for my choice of words for knocking yourself out. But if you would like to go in and proclaim this is a position you want to take, feel free. That's your prerogative. Secondly, uh, to Mr. Herman, are, um, how many policies do we have in uh, HR that include punitive violations that, I'm sorry, that include punitive fees for violations? Uh, good. Afternoon, commissioners. You said fees. Yes, this is a fee. This is a fine for a punitive fine for a violation of an HR policy. How many of those do we have on the books? You know, off the top of my head, commissioner, I don't believe we have any that are, imposes a fine on an employee for some bad act. It's typically some type of discipline action or a recoupment of funds if we find some bad actor in our population. Okay, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this policy now is saying that we would be also implementing a fine on an employee who does this wrong, correct? Am I reading this wrong? Fine is only in respect to an elected or appointed official who cannot be terminated. So it is a personnel policy or is it just a policy? Because if it doesn't apply to personnel and it only applies to appointed or elected officials, then how is it a personnel policy? It's not a personnel policy, and that is why this policy, um, I think, is being brought forward. There is already an anti-nepotism personnel policy that is part of the Civil Service Act, uh, but the Civil Service Act only reaches and applies to uh, people who are classified as employees of Fulton County. There are a lot of other folks associated with Fulton County who represent Fulton County in some capacity who are not classified as employees, um, and I think this policy seeks to uh, hold them to the same standard as our employees. So the portion of the proposed policy that um, talks about fines being imposed is in that second paragraph that applies to people who are not uh, beholden to or report to an appointing authority so that, um, practically speaking, would be elected officials. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I know, we have, I know we have at least one other policy that um, allows us to levy fines, and that would be our decorum policy. Are there others that allow us to levy fines? I don't know any off the top of my head. There may be, but um, since you bring it up, the decorum policy is another policy that, um, like this uh, provision in this policy, is an attempt by the board to essentially hold itself to a certain standard. and so. You don't report to an appointing authority, so you as a board and as a body are deciding then to hold yourself accountable in this fashion. Does that policy not have dollar amounts associated with it? Um, I believe it does. 
So it's practice then, certainly, to come up with a relevant dollar amount that we think is appropriate to find as opposed to just making up numbers based on whoever's in front of us or whatever we feel like. That is one of your options in terms of taking this kind of action, but um, allow me to say that if you did it on a case-by-case -case basis, that is also not, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do case-by-case -case evaluations as well. You'll just be subject to the same reasonableness um, evaluation on review as any other action that you would take. Thank you. I would just like to be really clear. I support the idea of this policy. I'm not anti this policy. I would just like it to be meted out fairly. I was asking for it to be held so that we could come up with an appropriate fine schedule and be fair about how we do it and be transparent with the citizens about what we're doing here and how we're doing it. That's all. I'm supportive of an anti-nepotism policy that goes further than the one that we had. I'm supportive of an anti-nepotism policy that is for elected and appointed officials. Just to be clear, just want everybody to know, what I don't like is the way this is being pushed through without clarity on what the fines are. All right, anything else? The motion on the floor is to hold. Let's vote, please. And the vote is open on the motion to hold. And the motion to hold fails, three yeas, four nays. Back to the main motion on the floor, which is to approve. Let's vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, two nays. Next item, Madam Clerk. Commissioner's full board appointments, 240278, Hospital Authority of Fulton County. The board of Trustees of the Hospital Authority of Fulton County submitted slate of names for the Board of Commissioners consideration to terms ending April 1st, 2028. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Barrett, and I'll just make one statement. I still have no idea what this board here does. The motion is to approve. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, one nay. Next item. Page seven, Board of Ethics. The Atlanta Business League has recommended Judy Walker for a full board appointment to a term ending February 12th, 2025. All right, I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Optu, Vice Chair Optu Rockman, seconded by Commissioner Natalie Hall. Uh, let's vote, please. I'm in the I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Arrington. Yes, the Board of Ethics is a joke. The Fulton County Code of Ethics is a joke. Uh, and the members of the Board of Ethics are a joke. They need to be disbanded, and we need to have hearing officers. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Mr. Arrington, you've made the statement multiple times. You have active matters before them. We've all heard this. You've stated your opinion. We've all heard it. I would just ask that we no longer hear it anymore. All right, the motion on the floor is to... This is a free country. This is America. I have a First Amendment right of freedom of speech, and I'm gonna say it every time and any time that I want to. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, one nay. On page eight, 240280, Board of Registration and Elections, Chairman Pitts has nominated Kathy Woolard to serve as interim chair, replacing Patrice Perkins Hooker for a full board appointment to an unexpired term ending June 30th, 2025. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Abdul Rockman, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I just want to say I think Ms. Woolard is uh, an excellent choice for this, so I appreciate the nomination, um, but I do have a question. Did, uh, to the county attorney, I guess, or the clerk, did we receive a resignation letter from Patrice Perkins Hooker? My office did not. I don't know if the board has received it, but she did announce an open session at the uh, meeting of the Board of Registration and Elections that she is resigning effective upon the appointment of her successor. So my question is, um, 
is there a, a specific policy about how um, someone on the board of registration and elections removes themselves? Like, I know we have, if we are trying to remove somebody, it has yes. to be for cause and with the hearing. Well, yes. But if they're removing themselves, does it have to be in writing? We are not aware of any specific method by which they would resign. Um, and because she is, a, she is a member of the board as opposed to an employee, I'm not even sure that our methodology would apply to her. Um, but she did make a public announcement of her resignation. Well, uh, we have, there, there are policies that determine, that, that constitute how that board operates. And yes. so if there is nothing there, I mean, if there is nothing specific about how she right. should resign, I, I just want to understand for clarity because we're heading into, you know, election season here and, um, you know, we're, we're going ahead and replacing somebody without something in writing, which I'm fine with. We all heard it. It was in an open meeting and I, I, I'm accepting that as a, as a standing uh, method of resigning. Yes. But that's not written anywhere. We just all sort of took that to be reality. So, and she intends it to be reality. I'm sure she wouldn't have said it. But my, I think my... The reason I'm bringing it up and asking the question is because if we don't have an official policy on how somebody resigns from that position, we should probably get one instituted. Put one in place. Um, because I don't, I think, you know, if, if Ms. Woolard, for example, were to say, you know, I've changed my mind at some point, like, does, does this board just replace without a formal letter? Does it have to be that they say it in their meeting? I just would like some clarity on that. I'm not holding this up for that. I'm absolutely supporting Ms. Willard, but I just want, I would like to get some clarity on that. Um, and you can get it to me offline if possible. So we will come up with some recommended um, language for your consideration. Awesome. Thank you so much. Commissioner Thorne. Um, I just want to state um, for the record that um, I realize this is kind of poor timing for a chair to step down, and we need someone who can pick up the gavel right away and lead our election department. Um, so I do see the need for somebody with experience. Um, I have reached out to Kathy Woolard, um, tried to schedule a meeting virtually, in person, whatever she could accommodate. She is uh, moving her mother into a nursing home, is my understanding, this week. She's out of the country next week. Um, so I haven't had the opportunity to meet with her and talk to her um, and see what her ideas are moving forward with, um, on the election board and things that she like, would like to see done. And I would like to be able to work with her in the future. So at this time, I simply can't vote for her. Um, I, I, I'm privy to her past as a board chairman. I'm hoping I can work with her forward, moving forward, um, but s simply without being able to talk to her, her being available, I can't vote for her at this time. Thank you. Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. Thank you, Chairman. I don't want to get too much in the weeds on this because for some reason we seem to want to get in the weeds on a lot of stuff and make it political. I believe that... Um, uh, Patrice Perkin Hooker, uh, uh, she resigned in an open meeting. I take her for a word. She's been a pillar of the community, known her for quite a while, her and her husband. And so I take her for a word, and I appreciate her resigning because I still stand by my statement that I said that it was just not a good look. Uh, I'm going to support Kathy. Have I been... Um, uh, may be critical of some things in the past. Yes, I have. But in any kind of political process, you want to give people chances. I have met with her. Um, some of the things I think we were eye to eye on, some that we weren't. But I think as far as her leadership and being able to effectively chair the Board of Registration and Elections, I believe she can do it. I believe at this juncture, with an election on the way, this needs to be seamless. We need to have her as interim. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I think sometimes if we as sitting uh, commissioners don't understand what our duty or authority is, if you feel like it's something that needs to be done or put in place, you can always put forward a resolution. If it's something that I can support, I will support you. 
but I think we kind of get in the weeds on stuff when we start saying, well, this doesn't say that, that doesn't say this, this doesn't say, say that. So I would, just, I would just ask all of my colleagues, if you feel that strongly, then put, put it in. I'll support you. Put in the resolution for something that's missing. I'll be more than happy to support you. But I think at this juncture, we need seamless leadership. She's already resigned. Whether she's done it by paper or not, she's resigned and she did it openly. And, and that was enough for me. So I'm going to support this and I'm going to ask my colleagues to please support it because one thing we don't need is to look like we are not, we don't have anybody at the helm and we've got an election coming. So I'm going to support it. Thank you. All right. Other comments? All right. The motion on the floor is to approve. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, one abstention. Continue, Madam Clerk. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes. On the next item, I'll just pull that since it's a duplicate. So noted. Commissioner's presentation and discussion items, bottom of page nine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hold my item as well, uh, hoping to meet with Kathy Woolard be before our next meeting. So noted. Wait, I'm sorry, what did you say, Commissioner? I'm going to hold the next item, the election discussion item, okay. so that I have an opportunity um, to meet with Ms. Willard. Next, next item. 240282, discussion, county vehicles, sponsored by Commissioner Ellis. Thank you. Um, just a, I just had to, I'll make this real brief. I know I had brought this up a, a few weeks back. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about vehicles, and I think a need for some more, um, it's obviously a substantive asset for us in terms of number of vehicles, right? Um, and I, I'd asked for some stuff and I just wanted to check in with where we were with having that ready for a report back to the board. It's my understanding that um, we will have some, and, and some of the specific things I had, I wanted to look at an inventory of our fleet, where it is, what it is, when it was purchased, what it, who's it's assigned to, who's using it, um, and along with some purchasing activity for the past four years. Um, and I, am, I do have some concern about asset control in this area and that we really maybe don't have our arms around this as well as what we should. It's my understanding uh, from Mr. Davis that you were, you, had, you were going to have this available to us within what kind of time frame? We anticipate having our physical review of the county fleet completed within the next two weeks. Okay. As a part of that effort, it will also include many of the data analytics you, refer you referenced. Okay. And one of the things that you noted you're going to have, you're looking at, you're, you're seeking to have visual verification of the fleet. That is correct. Okay. Um, and that you, your, your team has been able to put their eyes on about three quarters of that today? That is correct. Okay. Could you pull that, pull this up on here real quick? I wanted to ask if you had been able to put your eyes on, on this particular vehicle or not when it shows it up here? No, sir. Okay. But that would be one you would look to try to identify and put your eyes on to see if this is part of our fleet. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, we had a lot of discussion about this particular vehicle. Uh, I don't know if this was sent to me by an employee. So I'd like to know if that ultimately is the vehicle when, you, when you're able to put visual verification on it. Uh, you can flash forward through some of the other photos, and I'd be curious to see if this is what it looks like on the inside or if this is something else. Keep going. Um, you know. Keep going. Keep going. I think that's it. And you can take it down. Um, but if that, if that indeed was a vehicle that was described as to be a command center vehicle, uh, then we're obviously not getting sort of clear information back to us, or you're not getting clear information back to you all when purchases are being made about what the specific uses of these vehicles are. So. I mean, 
Yeah, I use that illust illustratively because that's, I mean, I would suspect that in terms of, uh, of a cost, that's probably the most expensive four-wheel vehicle that we would have, probably about 220000 of a four-wheel vehicle. I'm assuming that's four wheels on that thing, right? More, more than four wheels, probably some of those may cost a little bit more money. Um, the other thing I want to raise and I want us to uh, consider in terms of, uh, of a policy, I do think it just sort of a good practice in terms of, of a county, and I'll talk to or, or uh, not looking to bring something forward as a motion or anything like right now, but I'd like to look at in terms of a resolution is in terms of um, standards around what goes on our vehicles and that what would go on those vehicles would only be things which are you know, notations of Fulton County government and the representative departments and that there would be no individual names of elected officials or other people on our vehicles, I think, as a, as a best practice that should occur. And I'm going to ask the county attorney to draft up a resolution with some language around that. Uh, so just letting you know that that will be forthcoming. Commissioner Thorne. We just got an email at 1238 today um, from Michael Schultz, the chief of staff for the sheriff. Um, and he, in the letter, he says, at the last board meeting, there was discussion about our mobile executive command vehicle. Several of you have reached out, but I'd like to offer the opportunity for all of you to have accurate information and to view the vehicle under discussion. Please let me know if you or your commissioner is interested. I just wanted to bring that forward. I um, appreciate his transparency in that. Um, I would also like to see um, if we could get some type of detailed information with the gas card usage that's associated with these vehicles, if possible. I know you've provided some before. Yes, ma'am, we can do that. Thank you, that's it. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Abdur Rockman. Okay, I'm I'm a little confused because it says at the last board meeting there was a discussion about our mobile executive command vehicle. Um, my understanding that this was a command center. Um, I, I'm going to need some. I'm going to need, and and I don't know if. You would do it, Dream, or maybe the county attorney, but my idea of what a command vehicle is, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing because the pictures I just saw is not a command vehicle. So county attorney, county manager, or Dream, if in fact, because when it, the, 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 the review that we had showed a $207,000 purchase that I asked about, when I asked about it, it was said that it was a command center. Now, if it's not a command center, I don't know what an executive mobile command vehicle is. So if we can get some kind of terminology for the sake of my understanding, I don't want to call something uh, a command center if it's not, if it's an executive mobile command vehicle or whatever. I just want to make sure we're talking about the exact same thing. And so if somebody can provide some clarity, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Arrington. Madam County Attorney, is the sheriff a constitutional officer? Yes, he is. So wouldn't he determine which vehicle he uses as his command vehicle? In theory, yes. Thank you. All right, continue, Madam Clerk. Bottom of page nine, twenty four zero two eight three discussion. Follow up on follow up to Cherry Beckert procurement review sponsored by Chairman Pitts. Sure. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, last week we heard, I thought, a very professional review uh, by the firm of Cherry Beckert. And now that we have been uh, notified of certain deficiencies, my question is what what's our follow up plan, if any? Or do we put, simply put the report on a shelf? Are you asking anyone, uh, staff any, that? Anyone, you, um, the manager, well, county attorney? The, certainly the items that were included in the report 
around improvements or um, items that we could consider from um, the procurement office's perspective. Felicia is reviewing those. Um, and if there are any changes that we believe we need to present to the board, um, we'll work with the county attorney's office to bring back um, whatever amendments to purchasing uh, to the purchasing ordinance would be required to implement any of the changes that the consultants um, or any of the recommendations, I should say, that the consultants identified. And Felicia has has started her um, her review of their recommendations, Mr. Chairman. All right, Ms. Strong Whitaker. Yes, Commissioner, I, I did start my review of the recommendation. Um, if the board recalls, there have been other recommendations that we brought before the board. Um, some time ago, we had a purchasing reform uh, task force that reviewed some purchasing issues. We brought them before the board. Some of them are coming back on this, um, uh, in this, um, in these recommendations. So I will remind everyone of the former recommendations we requested and the new recommendations. And so I will have a response to their, um, their recommendations and changes. I don't agree with all of them. Um, I don't concur with all of them, let me say that. And so I will um, provide my response. Okay, Commissioner Harrington. What I would like to see is a list of all procurements that were done during COVID that were done outside of the normal procurement process. Because what was presented last week were one or two examples of procurements that were done outside of the normal process, but they were done during COVID. And I would submit to you that over 90 percent of everything that we did during COVID was done outside of the procurement process and that we had to come back and retroactively do things. And so I think it's very unfair to try to paint a picture that someone did something outside of the procedure and not acknowledge the 10,000 other things that were done outside of the procedure during COVID. So when can we get a list of every procurement that was done during COVID that didn't follow the normal procedure. So Commissioner, the emergency procurement provision is part of the purchasing code and we followed the emergency procurement procedure. I have a list of all of that. Every one of them came back to the board for ratification. I can give you a list for 2020, 2021, 2022. Or yeah. those that were that we saw last week, did those come back and get ratified too? Which ones that we saw last week were constitutional authority ones, not the not by not pursuant to an emergency. Did they come back? Did they get ratified? Which ones are you speaking of? The ones that they presented last week. The, the ones, ones he just put up on the screen. The ones that he presented. The van that wasn't done by emergency. That was done pursuant to the sheriff's constitutional authority. We processed that PO because he submitted well, the invoice. Yes, ma'am, was it ratified by the board? No, it was not. They don't oh. require ratification. Oh, it doesn't require ratification? No, constitutional authorities do not require ratification. Okay, oh, awesome. So, um, I guess we're gonna change the Constitution. That, that sounds like that's not only gonna take next session, but also a vote of the citizens of Georgia, because that is what is required to change the Constitution of Georgia. A lot of stuff in that constitution that I don't agree with, like people assigning jobs and duties to other people, even jobs and duties that they don't even have, nor the authority to have. There's a lot of stuff in that constitution I don't agree with, but it takes a lot to change it. Vice Chair Opti Rockman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I can only speak for myself. Uh, the review that the individuals gave on the last BOC uh, was that they said it was recommendations. 
And so, like anything else with recommendations, I think the sheriff should be allowed to make recommendations. I believe the DA should be allowed to make recommendations, and I think our executive team should be allowed to make recommendations whether they, what they think is best or not best. I didn't come away from that as though that they were attacking anyone. They, I, I specifically asked the question as far as guidelines. They said smaller governments, uh, uh, possibly rural areas uh, where everybody knows everybody, you don't need fail-safe uh, requirements in place. But as, as the governments get larger, you have larger areas, you may need a little bit more uh, fail-safe. You may need a few more requirements. But I did not walk away from that as though that was something to say negative. It was recommendations based on a review. And so I would ask county manager, uh, as a sitting commissioner, that we allow our constitutional officers to give what they consider to be their opinions with the review, or if something as far as guidelines, just like uh, 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 Ms. Strom Whitaker just said, some of the things she agrees with, some she don't. And so I think for this body to get to some type of a consensus to make sure that we have what we need in place, we need interaction from everybody. So I would ask not only do we deal with the report from what I consider to be the subject matter experts, but we also need input from our con constitutional officers, and we need input from our uh, county uh, executive team as well. So I would ask that moving forward. Commissioner Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things that was in that report was um, related to us maybe not getting as much uh, grant money as we could be, that there may be some room for improvement on that front. Um, can we get a response from the grants department or Dr. Rush somewhere, I don't know, Mr. County Manager, who would respond to that? Uh, we have started looking at it. I mean, I, I did a cursory analysis of their analysis. And if you really looked at it, it's two years. It's a subset of municipalities or counties only two of which are substantially different than ours in terms of receipts, both of which sit on, right on top of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, I'm kind of nonplussed by their analysis, but we're still going to engage with them, listen to what they had to say. I think the finding that they had, which I'm very leery of, is the application of indirect expenses as part of grants, because that will be a gift that keeps on giving if we apply indirect expenses and then they're challenged and then we inappropriately have done so and then we refund the money. So all of these, and, and I don't understand quite frankly, which I said at the time, how a process review of business controls ended up in uh, pursuing grant revenue other than having been a salesman, they're looking for the next uh, revenue opportunity. So, but nonetheless, we're gonna consult with them, listen, see what we can find out from that, and then bring that back. It's probably a good time, and I, I think I've uh, exchanged messages with Commissioner Thorne, to just review with the board what our grants process is, because many years ago, we reformed it to ensure that we were not returning money, because that was the problem at the time. And part and parcel to that was creating a grant administration office. That's why there's a report on certain board agenda uh, for that. Secondly, was to hire a grant uh, writing team to help departments. And then the third component is to really push for our departments to identify grant opportunities, because there's not really a central way of effectively doing that. You need the subject matter expertise. But I'd be glad to come back and review all of that. And then in that context, I'll also opine on, is there anything that we learned after we do a deeper dive with uh, Cherry Becker on any best practices that we're not following? Thank you, uh, Mr. County Manager. Uh, just a follow-up comment to what you said. I mean, if that is why that was in the report, that it's a sales tactic, that's kind of disappointing. And maybe we need, um, you know, from the audit committee that requested this review, maybe a little bit better controls about what is to be reviewed if we're going to ask, because that seemed to be part of the issue 
that everybody had uh, last week as well, that there was a, you know, it was a cross-section, but was it directed, was it not? I, I, I don't want to call it into question. I'm sure there's valid stuff in there and, and some that's not. Um, and, and as I think Vice Chair, or sorry, uh, Commissioner after Rockman, Vice Chair after Rockman said, God, it's late in the day, sorry. Um, that, that, you know, we can all, there's lots of, you know, opinions can go both ways and, and certainly any department that's being um, called into question has the right to respond and we don't necessarily have to take everything they say as gospel, um, but it's certainly worth, to your point, looking into uh, Mr. County Manager, so thank you for that. Commissioner Ellis. Yeah, I think they, uh, I'm glad that you all have started to meet and think about, you know, kind of some package of things that, you know, that were some good takeaways that could help improve our um, purchasing procedures and maybe streamline them. I think maybe those are the ones in particular, you know, as respects to grants, one of the reasons why that the audit committee, you know, um, didn't really give a whole lot of credence to that and we encouraged them not to make that any sort of strength that we didn't we didn't feel like it was particularly either i think what they looked at in, and you'll find in terms of the com comparable counties where they were getting a lot of grants money it was in transportation so as a relative percentage it was a lot more than ours were but those particular entities also were doing a lot of infrastructure related stuff where they were getting you know significant amounts of grants for um, and I think that was creating probably what the distortion was. So uh, I'm not sure how much you necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, the, there were a couple of other good things within it. I thought that were, and I'm glad you highlighted what took place and reiterated what took place and how we were transparent to, um, to the public about how we handled emergency procurements during the whole time during COVID. Because we were very deliberate about it. We we're very transparent about it. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't allow a mobile executive uh, Sprinter van for our county manager and staff to be purchased unbeknownst to us and uh, Somehow just get procured right all this stuff was coming back before us It was clear transparency about what was done and where there were some clear things in there where in retrospect We you know had some questions around and you know we guided you and directed you in, in the future to, if there were similar type things to maybe be a little bit more circumspect on some of those things as well. I remember as we were having those discussions. So, um, but where I'm going with this is in Felicia, if there are, you know, these procurements that are happening outside of um, coming, flowing through you that, you know, are being made through constitutional officers or whatnot. Um, I do think looking at a way where we could establish a practice to codify what those are and have those reported on in the framework of our meeting, you know, even if it's just sort of a placing of these things on the consent agenda, have and showing what they are, what the amounts were, who the vendor was, was it from competitively procured, you know, yes or no, whose office procured it, um, you know, et cetera. And then having these things there so there is a visual transparency for us and the public as to what these items are or were. Uh, so I think that would be something that, and I believe that's codified in somewhere in one of the recommendations. Um, I think that that would be something to look at. Um, the other thing I think that would be useful to, to think about is in the context of um, the types of procurements that might be done outside of our system, which are the types of things that, you know, we look at organizationally and we say, there's not, an, there's not really the infrastructure to do Given the size of the procurement, the infrastructure doesn't exist, the control structure doesn't exist, to really do the procurement in a way that's acceptable in terms of the way that you would expect government procurement to be done, right? Is there a size threshold with that? A million bucks, 500,000 bucks, 250, whatever it is. And identify what those particular contracts are. So we know what they are, and I think we might want to have some discussion at a board level around hey, you know, these types of things we deem like that they should go through our procurement system, period. End of story. And whether we need to look at ways to restructure that and codify that within the confines of our budget to ensure that that occurs that way, or whether we need to look at, um, you know, potential changes to county code or state legislation, I, I think we could avoid that. I think we could probably get at it in other ways is my point. I think with a combination of disclosure and then identifying, you know, kind of more significant size procurements 
uh, that really for the sake of everybody should go through a centralized process. Um, and I think that could be an opportunity for, and it's gonna require a little bit of work and some back and forth, I think, with some of the other, some of the other offices, but I think that work could put us into a space where we all get a little bit more comfortable and there's less friction in, in, this, particular, in this particular sort of structure and area. Commissioner Thorne. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna mention the disclosure, emergency procurements be put on our consent agenda to make us aware. Uh, I briefly talked with uh, Felicia about maybe bringing back a purchasing committee like you had in the past. I'm gonna get filled in on that, I guess. It's more detailed than I thought. Um, as far as the grants go, um, I did talk to them after the meeting and that wasn't their intention to sit here and compare grants. They just know in the procurement process that a lot of counties mess up the grant, getting paid back by the grants. And in that process of acknowledging if we were following up the guidelines of grants in our purchasing departments, um, they just noticed that they, had, they didn't have the data that they thought they'd have in comparison to other counties. So it wasn't like they were, oh, look, we, it was something they just kind of stumbled on while they were looking at the procedures. At least that's how they explained it to me. Um, another thing they explained to me um, was uh, they, they weren't given direction on what departments to look at, who to examine. Um, they were just given an open, here's, can you do a study of our procurement processes? So it was not biased research. It's just our constitutional officers purchasing floated to the top. Everybody else, I think, is going through the correct procurement process procedures. Um, I do, I am a little bit sensitive um, as a former consultant. You know, your name and your reputation when you work with the county is on the line and you want to do good work and you want to be respected, but if you're consistently told that your work is crap because it's biased or you're not qualified because you don't have a CPA and stuff like that, that really dangers other companies from wanting to come and work with us. So I think we need to watch our tone in the meetings. Um, I don't agree with the consultants on the jail, um, but I try to argue with them on a something that I don't agree, I mean, I, I'll, I disagree with, but I don't label, blanket label, like your research is crap, you're biased, and all that kind of stuff. I think we ran into this before I came into office, um, trying to hire consultants for the elections department. Um, they didn't want to come near Fulton County at all. It was very difficult, so um, I'm hoping moving forward that um, Cherry uh, Beckhart is a very reputable company and we will treat them with respect. All right, other comments? So just an observation, the, uh, we seem to be dancing around all the, the three or four high risk areas that they mentioned in that report. One being that, that vehicle, and I'm certain that the sheriff will have a, a reasonable explanation for um, whatever he spent on that vehicle. And there was a food service contract and there were two, one or two others that were labeled as, as, uh, as high risk. So my question, uh, Mr. Manager and Madam County Attorney, what is our role now that we are aware, because they, they came very close to the line of impropriety. They didn't say that, they didn't use that word, but the, if you read the report, so now that we are aware that there may have been some problems. What is our role? I mean, do you investigate? Is it the solicitor or is it the district attorney? I know when I was across the street, you know, the city attorney got involved. Um, then we'd even send things over to the district attorney. So even though uh, an officer may be a constitutional officer, have discretion to spend their budget, um, make business decisions and operational decisions in the way they see fit, their utilization of funds that derive from the county are still subject to the county's 
general um, audit uh, provisions. They still are subject to cooperating with audits. So if the board believes that there is a reason to look into whether there was impropriety in spending and investigate that, you would have several options. One of them is through our office. You could also do it through the county auditor function um, or any number of other uh, methodologies. But um, their actual uh, propriety of spending um, is something that the Board of Commissioners and Fulton County does have purview over, um, although you wouldn't be able to manage their daily business decisions. Uh, Commissioner Arrington and Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. I think we should be real careful talking about improprieties. The county attorney said that they were constitutional officers and that they had the discretion to do it. Alleging that something was done uh, improperly or um, was inappropriate without an investigation <laughs> is, is dangerous and uh, certainly none of us would want that done to us. And so, I mean, these high risk areas are a result of the Georgia Constitution. You're talking about high risk areas from constitutional officers that have the constitutional discretion. We have a clerk of superior court that gets over $300,000. And I'm not targeting this current clerk because the previous clerk got it and the clerk before that got it, right? It's a, it's a function of that job and the way the Georgia Constitution is written. And so if we have a problem with the Georgia Constitution, then we need to change the Constitution. I've got some items I want to list to put on that list. If we have a problem with the Constitution, let's change the Constitution. But to, to attempt to allude and insinuate that people are doing things right up against the line and they didn't say it was improper, but it was almost improper, like that, that's completely inappropriate. Completely inappropriate. That is within the discretion of those constitutional officers. Um, and so um, if we want to change the Constitution, let's change the Constitution. It'll be probably be next year unless we get the governor to do a special call session and get it added to the presidential election ballot, probably the best time to do it. Because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that someone, that a clerk of superior court in any county in Georgia could keep all of the money from passport fees and none of that money goes back to the county or the county employees. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So, if you're talking about you want to make changes to the Constitution to make sure to get rid of these high-risk areas with all constitutional officers, that makes sense. If you're trying to target two people because it's an election coming up in three weeks, that does not make sense. Vice Chair Abdul Rockman. Yes, Chairman. I don't want to belabor the issue. The issue for me is the infrastructure. Uh, what I got from the report is that we may not have the infrastructure in place that we need to have. Um, I don't know how we went so far left, but for me, I just want to go on record saying you don't know if you don't know. When you do know, you do better. Now, you can't legislate common sense and you can't codify it. We know that. But however, if the way we are operating, if we need to look at our processes, if we need to look at our infrastructure when it comes to those areas, I, for me, I don't think that's an issue and I don't think that's an uh, accusation. And so for me, I can only speak for me. I'm not accusing anybody, but I am saying that based on a review, we, we have some work to do. It is what it is. And so for me, I would say for all parties interested, if we can do the work 
And if we could come up with some guidelines or some infrastructure, I'll be for that. But I'm, I'm not trying to accuse anybody, but I'm also not trying to put a blind eye to the fact that if there are certain processes that don't have the infrastructure to control that process, then maybe we need to review it. So I just wanted to just go on record saying for me what I look from this and what I look forward to be it, for it to be. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I do think Vice Chair sort of hit on a couple of points. I think, and I said this multiple times during our conversation last week, I think if you li really listen, what creates the high risk is a lack of an internal control structure when those procurements were being done outside of our system. I mean, constitutional authority is one thing, but to say the, the Constitution made me do it, Constitution allowed me to do it, and so therefore I had the authority to do it, so then it makes it all fine for me to have done something that the average person would look at and say, that's either out of bounds or it wasn't done in a way that there was a significant, there was a substantive internal control process that was involved. That should exist within every element of our government that's doing purchasing or is controlling funds. There should be an internal control structure that's there. What we heard from them in terms of the context of those procurements that were being done outside of our system, there was, there was an absence of that. And that's the part of, I think, that we need to get addressed. And either that either need to come through in a way where we've got assurances that there are, and we understand what those purchases, purchases that were made outside of it and how, what sort of system of control was around it, or they come back through our system and that's how they're done. I mean, I, I would remind a lot of folks up here is this is a relatively new issue for us in terms of the history of Fulton County government. Um, we did not experience this with um, our prior sheriff because those procurements were all coming through our procurement officer, these substantive, these substantive procurements. And there wasn't, we didn't have some of these scenarios that have played out, have played out, those didn't exist, they're new. So we can easily get back to it, I think, and have a point that's acceptable for everyone and that provides some confidence to the taxpayers. And that's ultimately, I think, what this is all about. Commissioner Natalie Hall. The problem lies in the fact that the sheriff is a constitutional officer and he has the ability to do things that others do not. It's very clear. You can ask the ACCG lawyer about it. He'll explain it to you in detail as I've said many times before. So we do need to tread very lightly on this particular issue and ensure that we are not doing anything against the law as it relates to the sheriff being a constitutional officer. And the reason why we didn't see anything like this happening with um, the previous sheriff is because he just simply went along with the regular procurement process as far as I could tell, and he didn't go outside of that. He did seem to utilize the purchasing department as uh, much as possible. So that is the difference between this sheriff and the other one. This one seems to know a lot more about what he has the capability and ability to do legally. Commissioner Ellis. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Um, I'm a county commissioner as well. I've sat through multiple ACCG sessions, maybe not as many as you have, but never once have I heard them suggest that any county official should be doing purchasing in a way that's at, that lacks an absence of internal control. Whether they have the authority to do it or not, we shouldn't be doing it. We don't set up our purchasing, purchasing mechanisms to have an absence of control in a process which is transparent to the public. So 
the mere, the mere, the mere suggestion that because a person may have an authority to do something, I will say this again, does not give them the purview to do so in a way that is void of any financial control. And the fact that you could sit up here and suggest that anybody in the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia is purporting that and pushing that, that message back to county commissioners, I think they would be offended. Um, and as I know they wouldn't. It's not what they say. Um, so if somebody's going to do, again, if they're going to do individual procurements outside of our system, they need to be able to demonstrate that they have a system of financial control. And this procurement review suggested that there is an absence thereof. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner Ellis, since you directed your comments directly to me by calling my name, I'm going to direct my comments directly to you, Commissioner Ellis. Were you not here during the time when the previous sheriff signed off on an unheard of 10-year medical contract? And then it was switched three years in a row? Okay, thank you. No, I have no idea what you're talking about in terms of that. And I know we pulled out the medical contract and we brought it in non-agency for procurement purposes during the time that I've been on this board. And it was when this particular sheriff came on board that it was suggested we put it back, the largest contract, I believe it comes before procurement to us or for, for a procurement decision to us. It was your recommendation that we place that back in the sheriff's budget and thus give him the autonomy for that when he didn't have a procurement structure that existed to be able to adequately procure it. So, yeah, that's what I recall. Well, you recall wrong. Yes, I, I, whatever. If you want to get the last word, you can, but you're dead wrong. All right, anything else, commissioners? Madam Clerk, any other matters that come before us? Yes, Mr. Chairman, on page 10, 24 -0284, discussion, decorum, sponsored by Commissioner Barrett. <clears throat> um, colleagues, I just felt like um, we should have a discussion about decorum following um, some of the things that occurred at last week's meeting. Uh, I think everyone probably saw that some video from our meeting um, went viral, for lack of a better term, and um, probably had more views than anything else this board has done, at least since I've been here, I know, um, and maybe longer. And, um, you know, I think we've sort of all allowed this to go for too long without addressing it. I think um, we all have some culpability in terms of how we speak to each other and how we speak to the people that stand at the podium or that, you know, sit in the seats um, to our right and left. So um, what, you know, I would at least ask, first of all, we do have a retreat meeting that is, I believe, now scheduled, correct? And I know we did talk about this a little bit at the first uh, rules, uh, rules retreat meeting that we had uh, several months ago. Um, and I know that we will speak about it again there, and I know... Uh, or I believe, hopefully, that we will tighten up the policies that we do have. <clears throat> but in the interim, I thought I would um, take a moment to read the policy that we currently have in place, or I should say rule, I guess, that in our rules for uh, how we conduct meetings, the rule on decorum states, all commissioners are expected to conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Commissioners seeking information from staff should do so within the, con the confines, excuse me, of proper decorum. A commissioner shall not speak until recognized by the chair and likewise shall not interrupt another commissioner's remarks. All comments made by a commissioner shall directly address the motion or item being discussed. The chair shall enforce the rules of decorum 
And if a commissioner believes that a particular rule is being broken, he slash she shall raise a point of order when recognized by the chair. With a second, the chair may either rule on the question or allow the board to decide the issue by majority vote. Any commissioner shall have the right to express dissent from or protest any resolution or action uh, sorry, of the board and have the reason entered into the minutes. No commissioner shall make or cause to be made any defamatory statement about another commissioner. The phrase defamatory statement as used herein is defined by Georgia law and includes the statutory definitions outlined. Uh, the reason that I read it all is because I think we individually have to take responsibility, and I hope everybody here will do that, to follow the rules, in particular the ones that say shall. Um, and that I also think it's important to note that as long as I've been here, been here, I've heard numerous commissioners at various times sort of hold up a hand and call a point of order or say decorum, and then nothing happens. So it does sound like we should make a point of until we, or if we change the policy, while this is still the policy, that if someone calls that, that we should be asking for a second and waiting for the chairman to either make a decision to rule on it or ask the board to vote. And we haven't been doing that. So, you know, I would like us to follow the current rule as written until we change it. Um, that's just my thoughts. And I also just want to make a comment that Breaking decorum isn't just about who is, is not just about volume. It's not just about talking loudly. Um, we have had commissioners, in my opinion, who have, you know, demeaned people quietly. Um, it's easy to talk down to someone and be disrespectful to a staff member, for example, without being loud. It's still breaking decorum. So I just want to be clear that it's not just about volume. Um, it's also about word choice and tone. Um, and everything else. And, you know, I called out Commissioner Ellis earlier for saying something I thought was disrespectful to me, um, something I probably wouldn't have called out in the past, but as I was focusing on these decorum rules, it really just occurred to me that if we don't call out all of it, then, you know, it's, it's not really fair. So, you know, if the attempt, if we could all sort of reset and make an attempt to treat each other and everybody else who comes in here with more respect, and frankly, to treat this body um, with more respect, and this room with more respect, um, I think it would be um, great. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Commissioner Barrett, where is that attachment that you're reading from? I'm, I'm trying to find it. It's, um, it's, yeah. it's not even on the screen. It's from this book. Oh, okay. It wasn't provided to us. No, I just pulled the book with me. Okay. That's the new, oh, that's the new book. Okay, okay. Um, that was very good, uh, what you read, um, because as I was stating earlier, that happened to me with Commissioner Khadija talking over me and the chairman having to bang the gavel. Um, and like I said, excuse me, you doing it again, Commissioner Khadija? I'm in the queue, though. Commissioner Khadija, you doing it again? You have the floor, Commissioner didn't, Hall. Didn't you just read you have, something about that? You have, the, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, as I was stating, um, that is what happened to me at the last meeting, which caused the, uh, the words that were passed back and forth between Commissioner Khadija. Um, I, too, was triggered because it gave me flashbacks of when she tried to fight me in executive session saying she was going to kick my ass and the police had to come and get her out of there. I'm sorry. My point of order is that she's doing the exact thing that Commissioner, Commissioner Barrett is talking about the decorum, the policy, and everything. You can't, she cannot take her time to personally beat me up because that's what she wants to do. If we're gonna have a conversation about decorum, let's have a conversation about decorum. Okay. Is the point of order done? Is it my time to speak since I'm still in yes, the queue? Just, just to on decorum, please. Yes, I am talking about decorum. Um, may I see that, please? I'm speaking specifically about what Commissioner Barrett, would you say number eight? Okay, thank you for 
giving me a quick reference. So I'm speaking directly about what Commissioner Dana Barrett just read, which says Rule 8 Decorum. It says all commissioners, and I'm going to read again in case everybody did not hear what she read. All commissioners are expected to conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Commissioners seeking information from staff should do so within the confines of proper decorum. A commissioner shall not speak until recognized by the chair and likewise shall not interrupt another commissioner's remarks. All comments made by a commissioner shall directly address the motion or item being discussed. The chair shall enforce the rules of decorum, and if a commissioner believes that a particular rule is being broken, he, she shall raise a point of order when recognized. And I'll stop right there because the point that I'm making is the part that says a commissioner shall not speak until recognized by the chair and likewise shall not interrupt another commissioner's remarks. And so what I'm speaking on is completely in line with the decorum policy. I'm simply giving you an example of what I endured at the last meeting, which most people did not see. Thank you very much. Commissioner Thorne. Um, yes, I, I'm, I travel with the rules of decorum now to every meeting. Um, that's why I've called um, a point of order um, rule of decorum, and it does not need a second. It says here, another commissioner need not second that point of order before an issue can be considered. So you raise a point of order, and then you say it's a decorum violation, then you take a vote. Uh, speaking of penalties or fines, they do have penalties and fines outlined here. The first violation is $250. The second violation that occurs within 12 months is $500. The third by the same violator in this section occurs within 12 months, it's $1,000. Um, and then it goes, it has a, a structure here. Uh, some of the, you receive a public, the board may publicly reprimand the violator for the offending conduct, which may be an official censure, reprimand, expressing the board's displeasure with the offending conduct. Uh, and some of the instances listed here, um, conduct that re references sexual acts, bodily functions, or demeans groups of people due to their religious beliefs or race, as I repeat, or race, that is inherently inappropriate for a formal proceeding before the board, and that is a reasonable person would find it is vulgar, profane, or obscene. Um, I'd also like to mention um, you're subject to public censor if you con your conduct constitutes unlawful harassment or discrimination in violation of state or federal law in this code. And they have a whole list of things, but I just wanted to reiterate those points. Vice Chair Abdurrahman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm willing to work with uh, Commissioner Barrett um, on this decorum. I'm also going to ask that the county attorney weigh in, because I have a recording, a particular commissioner, I won't call her name, uh, called my phone, cursed me out. And so I don't know if legally that can be put in decorum, if the decorum was just going to be a situation that applies here. I would hope, and this is my personal opinion, because this morning I apologize, and it looks like I'm gonna have to apologize again, because we cannot seem to move past personal dislike. I can, I can not care for a person's action and still respect them as a colleague. And if we are going to deal with decorum, decorum has to allow a person to make a point of order to the chairman and the chairman respond without that person denigrating the person. The decorum has to be where a presenter can come here and present without being screamed at. The decorum has to be one where you don't come two weeks, three weeks later and say something about some, something that somebody did then when you could have called it out like Dana Barrett, excuse me, Commissioner Barrett did it at the time that it happened. 
Either we're going to be a legislative body or we're going to be a reality TV show. We can't be both. We cannot be both. So commissioners, I say again, I apologize. Let's move forward. Let's do better. And if we're going to have a decorum policy, let's meet in the confines of the time between that we are here, not on the day of, but the days that, because we're a commissioner 24-7. You ain't a commissioner just the first and the third Wednesday. You're a commissioner 24-7. So meet with your colleagues. Make sure that we have the decorum policy in place. But more importantly, what we have not been doing it is enforcing it. So it doesn't make any sense for us to have any policy in place if we're not going to enforce it. And so I would ask county attorney, please let me know if legally any disparaging voicemail messages or texts threatening uh, bodily harm to someone, uh, if that would, could be uh, put in the decorum policy. And I remain who I am when I first started, someone that wants to legislate with the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Commissioner Dana Barrett. I, I like that everybody's using my full name now, not just Commissioner Barrett, I'm Commissioner Dana Barrett. Um, look, I just want to reiterate that we are having our next rules retreat session. Uh, I believe it's at, you know, on the same day as the, I think everyone was polled for dates, and I believe it's at the, it's following the next board meeting. So, you know, I'd be happy to continue this conversation there, and I appreciate um, people being willing to have the conversation. Um, all due respect, Vice Chair, you interrupting Commissioner Hall while she was just speaking is a decorum violation. So I appreciate that it's not yelling or whatever, but it, it technically you were interrupting her while she was speaking. Um, so I, I, again, I just want to reiterate that I think it's all the things. It's not just being loud or yelling or arguing. It's, it's all of the courteousness and respect that we are due each other and those that we're talking to. And I also want to point out, uh, with, again, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, it says right in the rules, and by the way, uh, Commissioner Thorne, thank you for reading the full law. I wasn't implying that there wasn't more to it. I was just reading what has, was excerpted in our rules book. Um, and yes, I agree that you don't need a second, but he could call for a second. So if there was some confusion about whether or not we were all in agreement and he wanted a second opinion, he could call for a second. That said, he alone can make the decisions. He can, the way the rules are written, the chair shall enforce the rules of decorum. So he doesn't have to wait for somebody to make a point of order. If someone breaks decorum, the chairman by himself can say, mm -hmm. this is a decorum violation, I'm giving you a warning, for example, and the next time it's gonna be a fine. He, he absolutely is within his rights to do that. Um, I would just ask respectfully that you start doing that mm -hmm. um, because I think it would help. And um, again, I hope we can continue the conversation and I appreciate everybody being willing to try to get there. Commissioner Arrington. The first thing that we need is to be educated on Robert's rules of orders. Just because you say point of order does not make it a point of order. If you say point of order, you have to be saying that the rules are being violated. You cannot say point of order and then just give your opinion or just talk. You have to specify the specific rule that is being violated. That is what a point of order is. So you can't just say point of order and then just go off on a tangent and start. There has to be a violation of the rules in order for you to make a point of order. So we need to first be educated on what that is. What is a point of order? What are Robert's rules of order? Additionally, in order to giving and receiving are the same thing. Same side of a different coin. If you want to receive respect, you have to give respect. And mumbling while people are talking and making important points and mumbling and snickering with your neighbor 
is, is a violation of decorum in and of itself. And when it proceeds on and on for eight hours in a day without being enforced, that is what leads to blow-ups because people are frustrated. Frustrated that they are allowed to continue to violate the quorum on and on and on. And so what came, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? You can't get someone for responding to a decorum violation with us with, with a decorum violation if you haven't done anything about the first violation. So we number one, we have to know what a point of order is. And if you're not saying that there is a rule violation, then you have not brought up a proper point of order. You just need to get in the queue to express your opinion. That's not a point of order. That's an opinion. A point of order is a rule that is being violated. And I talk loud, I'm loud, I got a deep voice, and it ain't nothing y'all can do about it. Vice Chair Optor Ronkman. You know, um, here again, uh, this conversation is very interesting because the same person that, that, that wants to say this is the same person that told me, well, I brought it to your attention because I expect better of you. Everybody on this body should expect the best respect of everybody. It is never a reason when somebody calls a point of order, even if they're incorrect, to be told to shut up. It is nothing that you can make that right. Secondly, to tell me, I expect better of you, Khadija, Commissioner Khadija, because you don't act like the other two, is a slap in my face to sit here and say something totally different. So what I'm gonna say, here again, talking to the people that are listening to us, the people who voted for us to come here. We are a legislative body. We are a legislative body that should be able to get along. If your hatred for me is more important than your allegiance to your constituents, then no decorum is going to work. No respectful manner is going to work. So again, I apologize to the taxpaying citizens who sent us here to legislatively work together. I know tempers are gonna flare. I know sometimes we are not going to agree and I expect individuals who are just as passionate as I am to have their say. But you can't decide, well, I like this one, I don't like this one. Well, I can scream at that one, but I'm not gonna scream at the other one. That is reality show, that is immaturity, and there's no place on this body for it. So I'm gonna apologize one more time. I'm willing to work with anyone that's willing to work with me. Because at the end of the day, they're not gonna call one commissioner's name, they're gonna call the entire body. And on that note, I apologize again. Have a good day. Commissioner Ellis. I, Mr. Chair, I'm just hoping we can move on to the animal control item. I would just say this about all of this and, and to both my Gentle person and gentleman from uh, to my left, and uh, gentlewoman from uh, District Three, um, and all of you up here. I, 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 I think some of the issue, issues we're dealing with here deep, go deep, much deeper than a decorum policy, and I'm not sure 
trying to wrestle with it in the context of policy is going to solve um, some of the issues that we've seen sort of manifest themselves. So it's just my open prayer that we can just collectively be better. And I'll end on that. Thank um, you, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, Madam Clerk, the last item, I think it's the last one. Yes, add on item 240286, request approval of an intergovernmental agreement for the provision of animal control services between Fulton County and the City of Atlanta, sponsored by Chairman Pitts. Mr. Manager. Yes, sir. Uh, long awaited. Uh, with the approval of the uh, City of Atlanta Council on April 15th, we did receive the uh, signed IGA by the mayor uh, for services going forward through the remainder, not only of this year, but through 2028. We also expect City Council to approve on 5-6 the service retroactive back to January the 1st, giving us the, uh, the original IGA in its term uh, as well as uh, conditions. Uh, in the interim, we have, as I said earlier this morning, taken in close to 100 dogs who've also worked closely with APD uh, and citizens to minimize the impact. So I want to thank uh, Joe Bearswain and his staff and Lifeline as our provider. Uh, we're prepared to resume full service immediately upon your approval. We've, again, talked to uh, everyone involved on our side, and we'll also reach out to APD to alert uh, them and remind citizens that they can call 404-613-0358 for animal services and the dispatch of a field service officer. So we're, we'll be happy to see this resolve if that's your will and look forward to informing, uh, again, citizens as well as uh, all of our uh, folks internally. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. It's 359. Let's vote favorably so we can resume service at 4 p.m. And the vote is open. And the motion passes unanimously. 359. Let's resume service. Any other matters that come before us? No further items. No further matters that come before us today, so we are adjourned. You know. For a written transcript of this meeting, or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the clerk to the commission's office at 404-612-8200. Thank you.